Hey, everybody. This is Craig Garber. Welcome to Everyone Loves Guitar. And we have a very interesting, cool guest with Marty Wall. She's got a great background. A uh, few announcements. First of all, for those of you who, like me, live in the South, in Florida, what Marty's in right now is called a basement. I remember those because I grew up in New York City, and I love those. And they're so, I'm just like, I wish I was in your basement, you know, because basements yeah. are just, yeah, it's, they're like man caves, you know, nobody, yeah, yeah. you know. Uh, uh, num uh, announce number two, Greco Barato. Thank you for connecting us. I appreciate it. He's an awesome dude. Uh, yeah. Also, make sure you go to everyonelovesguitar.com forward slash subscribe, and you can subscribe to the audio and video of the podcast. Carlos Santana, Joe Wait. Walsh, no relation to, to Joe, right? Uh, no. No. I, I'd love no to get those. No relation to Carlos. No relation to Carlos <laughs> or Joe. I'd like no. to get uh, both those guys on the show, so if someone could turn me on, please do. And um, also, I, I'm really rough looking today, according to my wife. I'm just getting over the flu. I know you're not watching this video you're to look pretty. at me, even on my best day, so thank you very much. All right, <laughs> Marty Walsh, this guy's going to be fun. Uh, assistant professor in the ensemble of music production departments at Berklee College of Music in Boston. He's also a veteran LA session player. He worked as a guitarist with some of the biggest names in the business. For example, he played on Nine to Five by Dolly Parton, and She Works Hard for the Money by Donna Summer. That was like the biggest song. We'll talk about some of these things, but he played on Heartlight by Neil Diamond. He's also recorded with John Denver, Eddie Money. That's a New York guy. Kenny Rogers, Sheena Easton, and Julio Iglesias, among others. In 1985, Marty did the guitar work on the Brother Where You Bound Super Tramp record, and then he toured with the band for a couple of years, then came back and toured with them again in the late 80s uh, on their, to do their 88 record, Free as a Bird. Not Free Bird, Free as a Bird. In 86, he toured with John, John Fogarty's touring band. That was John's first post credence uh, tour which is cool yeah. and he continued doing recording sessions into the 90s he was also a part of the live band on nickelodeon the the nick tv show that saved every parent's life when that came out because now we had something to stick our kids in front of that we felt we, we we didn't feel like such i didn't feel like such a complete loser you know uh and uh, so he was part of the Nickelodeon television show Roundhouse that, at, that ran from 92 to 94. And in the late 90s and early 2000s, Marty was a guitarist on a number of Curb Records releases, including three of Leanne Rimes' albums and country star Steve Holly's Good Morning Beautiful. Beautiful, excuse me. He also has an instrumental solo album called The Total Plan, which is... He's going to talk about that, too. Apparently, he has a good story about the title. We'll check that out. And uh, we'll learn about Marty. Hey, man, thank you for your time. I appreciate you coming on the show. Man, I, I appreciate you uh, uh, doing this. And uh, certainly a shout-out to Greco Barado, who, interestingly, I didn't even know the guy. Really? He, no, but well, no, check this out. I didn't know him. And I get a, a, a Facebook message from him. And he says, hey, I'm going to be in town playing with Katie Lang. And, and you, I dig your playing. <laughs> He's a younger guy, you know. Yeah. He's like, I, I've always dug your playing. Uh, would you like tickets to the show? And I'm like, wow. You know, like, well, we had a mutual friend, you know. So, so I go, Joe, sure. was it Joe Pasapia? No, it was oh. Eric Holden. Okay. Eric Holden, know. bass player. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, so my wife and I go to the Katie Lang show, which was absolutely phenomenal. I had no idea about Katie Lang and her thing. I knew nothing about it. I just thought, well, this is cool. This guy sounds cool, man. Let's go do this, you know. And uh, great show and really a sweetheart, man. I mean, great guy. He, he texted me, um, I don't know, what was it, a month ago? Or yeah, something, something like that. He goes, month, hey, I just weeks. did this thing and you need to do one of these. <laughs> I'm like, okay, cool, you know. But That's anyway, so yeah, funny. he's a very, very cool guy. They're very cool. I met him at NAMM. We got we 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 met in person. It was cool. Sweet guy. Really good guy. Really deep you? guy, did man. I, did I miss you at NAMM this year? Yeah, I was, I was in there. and out, man. Were you at oh, NAMM? Okay. You weren't. Why would you I be at NAMM? I was there on Sunday. Why would you subject yourself to that? Well, uh, ah, because I tough. hadn't been there in years, and a producer friend of mine that I was actually doing sessions for. Oh, uh, okay. What, what NAMM was last? Two weeks ago, I think. Two, two weeks, weeks ago. Weeks, yeah. So I'm. I came into LA on Saturday. On Saturday. Hmm. Uh, went to Nam on Sunday. My buddy was speaking. He was doing a couple of things, and I I know all these people, man, that I haven't yeah, seen in 25 years. I haven't seen Paul Rivera. 
I had not seen um, uh, John Sir. I mean, you know, there were a bunch of these guys that I just knew over the years back in the 80s when we were doing all this stuff together. So, you know, I went there to like, you know, check them out and say hello and do some things. And it was cool. You know? Had a good time? Yeah, great, man. It was great. And then I did these sessions at, at, um, at United uh, with Je just for this producer, Jeff Weber. It was a particular project for a um, an Asian, a, uh, this woman from Taiwan is a film composer. And um, I want to talk to you about the Bose S1, which is an amazing speaker for acoustic guitars that I've been playing lately. The S1 has two separate channels. It has one for your guitar and then another one for a microphone. And then there's a third channel you can use for a looper or for backing tracks that you could access by Bluetooth or through a one eighth inch plug. And the S1s are also very easy to carry. It's got an easy to grab top handle and absolutely anyone can tote it around. And it's also rechargeable for up to 11 hours. The S1 was specifically designed to optimize the sound of your acoustic guitar on acoustic guitar gigs. The guitar and mic channels each have separate tone, volume, and reverb controls, and there's also a proprietary tone match switch, which restores and optimizes the natural sound of your acoustic guitar, which as you know, is typically the biggest problem with acoustic amps. Now I tested the S1 myself and the tone, volume, and reverb controls sound great and they're very responsive. You can position the S1 in four different ways. You can tilt it back so you broadcast out to an audience or you could put it horizontally, vertically, or on a stand. And the cool thing is the S1 has a Bose accelerometer so it automatically adjusts the EQ and optimizes the sound for whichever one of these four positions you're using. The S1 also happens to be the best Bluetooth speaker that Bose makes, which is pretty compelling since Bose is known for the quality of their Bluetooth speakers. So effectively, you have an acoustic guitar amp, a PA, and a killer Bluetooth speaker all in one. And the bottom line is this. If you're an acoustic guitar player, there's absolutely nothing out there that sounds this good and this big that's also easy to carry and battery powered. As far as the Bluetooth speaker goes, I've used it many times here at home for family barbecues and the sound is so good, my kids wind up arguing over who gets to play the music they want. You know, it's literally like having a full stereo system out on your patio. You can use the S1 for DJing, tailgating, or whatever you want. Before this, you'd have to spend a bunch of money on loads of different speakers and pedals to get the same thing the S1 does on on its own. On top of that, it looks great just like all Bose devices do. And besides whatever money back guarantee you get from wherever you buy the S1, Bose also warranties the S1 for two years for any kind of defects in materials or performance. For more information and to find out where to get your own S1, go to everyonelovesguitar.com forward slash S1. That's everyonelovesguitar.com forward slash S1. Get the S1. It's out standing. Are you looking to buy or sell a home in the Tampa Bay area without having to deal with pushy realtors? Then make sure you connect with West Florida Real Estate. West Florida Real Estate has helped over 300 homeowners and investors buy and sell their properties over the last five years. Their service is outstanding, just like back in the days when there was actually service in the service business, and you'll never have to deal with any kind of sales junk when you're working with them. For more information, email Ann with an E at WestFloridaRealEstate.com. That's A-N-N-E -N -N -E at WestFloridaRealEstate.com. If you're enjoying this show and you'd like to support it, go to EveryoneLovesGuitar.com forward slash support. And for information on advertising, visit EveryoneLovesGuitar.com forward slash advertise. Are we allowed to say that anymore? Like an, a an Asian? Are we allowed to say that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Someone's Asian? We can? Okay. I think so. I think it's, I, I think that's cool. I All right. No, I'm cool. just, I don't anyway, know. <laughs> beep it out. She's from Taiwan. <laughs> and uh, and uh, she did a project in 2004. And, and I was still kind of going back to LA and doing sessions then. When I left Los Angeles, I left all of my studio session gear there. Oh, all wow. Of my, all of my equipment stayed in LA. And I would... I was working here in my home studio that I'm in now, producing local projects. And then I'd get a call to like come and, and do session work in LA. And I'd fly to LA and I'd, you know, go stay with my mom, grab her car, you know. That's go, awesome. Go. Yeah, and I was doing, so I was still kind of doing stuff back and forth, you know. And, um, 
Anyway, so he had hired a particular group of people, Marco Mendoza on bass, Vinny Caliuta on drums. Uh, oh my God, that's so funny. Adapo on keyboards. Uh, David, uh, shoot, I'm losing my mind. Um, oh, I forget his last name, on percussion. Early Drummond as well. Anyway, so, so he calls me up after last year's NAM and says, hey, Christina's back. Uh, she's, she wants to do another record. And so you want to come back in January? And so I was there doing that. That's awesome, man. Oh, it was great. It was great. A lot of fun. I, uh, I, for research purposes, I went into a weed shop because we don't have those here. And man, they're, again, just for research. And uh, wow, they're very interesting, man. It's like, I didn't know weed was, uh, who knew that you can, it's like a record store. There's like different genres. And then within the genre, there's hard. And and I'm like, holy shit. How do you, you how, know, about, a, how about the people, how about all those people that are sitting in jail for oh, all those years? How now, crazy is that? And they're, they're going to be going, well, what, what, you know, what are you doing? You know. I, but you know, it's really weird. People smoke weed. A lot of people I know smoke weed for anxiety. Yeah. I walked in there and I got anxious because I'm like, what the fuck? I mean, like that thing, I, I, I'm not prone to anxiety at all. Zero. In fact, I'm like, I can walk through a war and just like, you know, whatever it is, it is. And, uh, but I was like, that made me anxious. I'm like, what the fuck? There's a million. I mean, that was really, you know, they should rethink this. You know, like if you I had keep anxiety. Up your research, bro. Yeah, man, I have to. Yeah. All righty. Tell me how you first got started in the music business and like well, what would you first break? Well, here's the thing. My father was a musician. Oh, okay. My dad played guitar, uh, guitar, played guitar and sang. He had great, he was a really good rhythm guitar player, man. As a matter of fact, when he was, before he was in Los Angeles, because I grew up in LA. And uh, before he was in LA, um, when he was a young guy, he actually played rhythm guitar on a radio show with Les Paul. He was his rhythm guitar player. Holy Les, crap. Les Paul was known as Rhubarb Red. The radio station in Chicago was WJJD. And my dad played rhythm guitar for him. Wow. He had, he had some pretty freaking hilarious stories about Les, which, you know, we don't need to go into. But <laughs> but anyway, um, uh, I'm the youngest of four. We're living in Glendale. My oldest brother, John, is a great singer. My dad gets him hooked up with Warner Records. Somehow... He, he, my wife, my brother winds up with Warner Records when he's 19 years old and, wow. he's, and they're grooming him to be, you know, this is like around like Bobby Rydell and people like that were, you know, I mean, yeah. ancient way, way back, you know, my brother's quite old. Um, and his career got sidetracked because of having to go into the, you know, the army selective service. Oh, my, it, my other, my other brother. To Vietnam? My, yeah, but he didn't have to go to, no, this is kind of pre, well, this is kind of right before Nam, and Nam was really starting up by the time he got out. He, had, he only had to serve a couple of years, I think. He wound up in the entertainment thing over in Europe, oh, entertaining great. the troops, you know. Good. So anyway, my other brother, um, he was a really good guitar player, and uh, he had a band with Jay Graydon, uh, uh, who uh, you probably know. Yeah. Jay was playing bass at the time. They had a band called the Go-Go's, and they'd be rehearsing in my parents' you know, den all the time. And um, and so I'm 12, and I go, hey, I, you know, I want to do this music thing like my brothers and my dad. And I bought a set of drums, right? Um, my parents didn't want, my mother didn't want me to get a set of drums. I'll never forget it. She, she, she said to my dad, she's because I had like my paper route, and I had my money, and I had a guy that had a kit, and I, you know, I'm like going, I go, I'm going to go buy this set of drums. And my mom sits down with my dad, and she says. Gene, you can't let that child buy a set of drums. Every drummer you've ever known has been crazy. <laughs> right? <laughs> Which actually turned out to be pretty true, you know. <laughs> but anyway, funny, um, uh, uh, my, <laughs> oldest brother, my oldest brother kind of caught wind of this, and we got talking about it, and he convinced him to let me do it. So I get a, a kit. I'm playing in a band with Jay Graydon's brother, Gary. Gary's a guitar player. And so, you know, I'm beating away on the skins, you know. And then it, when I'm about 15, I'm banging around on my dad's old Martin, which I still have. I've got it here. Oh, that's amazing, man. And, um, and, and my brother Dan says, you're a Walsh, dude. You're a guitar player. Y you need to sell the drums and get a guitar. 
<laughs> so I did. And then just I like just, that. Yeah. And then I then I heard I heard the John May Albino record. Ah, uh, okay. And it was all over. Yeah, kind of like, hard. What on earth is this? And I learned yeah. every note on that record. I, I needle dropped every rhythm part, every solo. Every, it showed me the whole thing, that fretboard and the phrasing, how he did. I couldn't yeah. do it. I couldn't do, I couldn't vibrato like him. I couldn't bend. I couldn't do all that stuff. But I figured out what it was, you know. And uh, yeah, that that was just that record. Uh, that's that's one of it's got to be you know one of the best guitar records in the ever. I mean his yeah. playing on that record, his playing on that record is he was never ever he was never better. He was great in Cream. Cream yeah, some of the Cream stuff was really good. Cream stuff was really good. I mean Crossroads, like, while my guitar gently which I you know like, yeah awfully good. But that Blues Breakers record, I'm sorry, he had lines. He's playing pentatonic. Yeah. But he has a way, he has a lyrical, melodic thing going on that nobody else had. And he still, I don't think he's, he doesn't have it anymore. It's, it went away or something. I don't know I what it was. he's changed, man. He just, cha you know, people change. He became a, he became a singer. That's what he people did. People change, There's yeah. some great stories about that with Delaney Bramlett and all, you know. It's hard to listen to that record and then say, hey, I want to play drums. So I totally get it. Yeah, <laughs> that's not going to be your first reaction. Yeah. So how? Did, okay, so how did you get started? And like, what, what was your first break? You know, not be a big break, but what was your first like, sort of the well, thing that said, you know, hey, you're meant to do this. Well, gosh, I mean, meant to do this. That's a that's that's kind of a big one. But <clears throat> I, you know, the thing is, when I was young, you know, there just wasn't another option. Uh, you know, I, I I graduated high school. I, had, I could play the guitar. I didn't know anything about what I was doing. I just know, put your fingers here. I okay. Went to, I went at Graydon said, go to LA Valley College and take all the music classes and learn theory, which I okay. did. Okay, great. I went there, did that. Then I studied with these, I studied with various, um, in, you know, teachers. But, you know, my father hooked me into playing um, what they call casuals in LA. Bar mitzvahs, weddings, wear a tuxedo, you know. Yeah. But the bread was good. Yeah. So my, so my my friends are playing five nighters, staying out all night, and I'm going. I don't want to do that, man. I want time off. So I would. I I had these gigs. I moved out of my parents' house. I had my own place in North Hollywood. You know, I was living with this in this crazy compound with these this this eccentric old uh, ex opera singer who she was cool, Daphne Silva. She only rented to male musicians. She had three. Uh, places on her property in the middle of North Hollywood, which is like, you know, sold and it's a high rise now or something. Yeah. And, um, and, and uh, so, you know, I'm out of the house and, you know, but I'm shedding, I'm, I'm practicing Monday, Monday through Friday. I'm practicing. I'd go do a gig on Friday night, two on Saturday, one on Sunday. I'd make enough money playing, playing bar mitzvahs and weddings, which I just hated. Right. Hated. That's the trade off. You know, hated. But, but I said, I have to do this. Now, see, this is one of the things. I wasn't, I didn't pursue, okay, well, I'm going to be in a band and like play in bars and, you know, and we're going to get famous. And I said, wait a second, I need to make money. That was my gig. And it was, a lot of it was because of Graydon. J okay. Jay Graydon was a huge influence on oh, my thinking okay. growing up. So anyway, so, okay. so I got my first, you know, my first gig that I got where I was actually not doing that was I got a call, there was a guy by the name of John Rosenberg who had worked with the Osmond family okay. on, tour, on tour. And they were big at the time. This is 70. Yeah, massive. 72, whatever. Yeah. So I'm a young kid and I get this call. Um, Dan Sawyer, guitar player, guy that I knew in, from college, he had heard about it because he knew John. And he said, hey, you should call this guy, Marty Walsh, to do the, you know, to play guitar in this show with a group called the DeFranco family. They oh, were of a course. Canadian, Canadian, you know. Yeah, they're huge. Singing group. And so we went on tour. I'll never forget it. The first gig was Arlington, Texas at a Six Flags. And I was making 600 bucks a week, I think, is what it was. And what and that's year pretty, was this? That's pretty good bread, man. What year was this? 74? Man, that's got to be like, I don't, I'd throw a dart, three grand a week? 
now? Close to well, it? Well, yeah. 2,600 no, maybe? It, yeah, it was all, we, we were playing the Six Flags and those kind of places all around yeah. the country, you know? Wow, good for you, so, 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 you know, so you do that and then you, then you go back, <laughs> that ends, you go back to the, you know, the bar mitzvahs, you know, which was a drag. But at the same time, I'm going, I'm not going to, the, my friends were all playing bars, man, hanging out till two, three in the morning. And I'm going, you know something? This is going to go nowhere, man. There's no time to do anything else. You hang out all night. You get up at 12. You have some breakfast at 1. <laughs> you do your whatever you got to do. And then you got to go to the next gig the next night. It's like, no, I can't. No. Okay, so let me I, ask I, you a I question. Always, I always felt like I got to go to the, you know, there's something bigger than just playing in clubs, you know. Okay, so where, for the long haul, man. Where did that come haul. from? Where did that come from, though? Because most young kids are like fuck this is awesome i get to sleep in the 12 we go hang out we go practice and then we party all night that's totally not i mean that's in your a feather in your cap that's not what most young kids i, I, I think i think my work ethic was my, i think my work ethic was pretty high you know it wasn't as high as it could have been but it was pretty high and and so you know i, I and, and here's the other thing my my brother dan used to come home and he used to say, hey, I just had this guy named Hal Blaine and Glenn, <laughs> these guys, Glenn Campbell, um, and uh, kind of was a keyboard player that played with all those guys, you know, playing on my song today, you know. And my dad used to go to the union to get his checks, right, for, for, for his, he would do society parties and weddings and stuff. He, he didn't do a lot of bar mitzvahs. He wasn't into that whole end of things. But he did a lot of like... Uh, you know, he had a trio and he would go play these gigs and, and it was union stuff. So yeah. he would go to the, he'd go to the union and he'd say, he'd say, you know, there's this other line. There's this other line on the other side of guys getting their checks. That's where all the session musicians are. And that's where the big dough is. I found out early on where the money was. That's, oh, what, I, okay. that's what I found out. I found out that the money was in, if you really want to make the bread, the money is in copyright ownership, songwriting royalties. That's the bread. My brother Dan had a hit, was living at, at home. And actually had moved out of the house, living in this funky pad on Bronson Avenue in Hollywood. Has a hit record called um, Temptation Eyes with the grassroots. So I don't know when this was, 76 or something like that. I don't know when, maybe earlier. And, and he, he moved out of that pad and bought a house in Woodland Hills. Just from and, the one song. Well, kind of. Well, he was signed to a publishing deal to a particular producer. And so he had money coming in because he was a songwriter. He gave up the guitar. He was a great guitar player. He had great hands. Graydon used to say, your brother had like the best hands, you know, for guitar, just physically. But he gave it up. He, and my brother Dan did the same thing. He was like playing in bars and he couldn't stand it. So he was able to wow. get into the songwriting game. Then I knew Graydon, right? So I knew Jay, and Jay was going, dude, you got to play the, the bar mitzvahs and stuff like that. You got to do that. But, but, you know, and Jay started to, I remember, I went over to his house one day. We, he had this place on Moorpark Avenue in, in the Valley. And this is before he was Jay Graydon. He was a, he had a little, he had a little four-track studio, and he's, you know, he was recording at his place, and he was, playing guitar and he was, you know, engineering and he was trying to figure out, he was kind of a jack of all trades mm. and a master of none actually. And he kind of, he said one day, I'm over at his pad and he, I, I'm not, I come, I walk into his place and he says, Hey man, like he would, Hey man, I don't know if you spoke to Jay, you should interview Jay, man. He goes, Hey man, dig. That's the, that's the psychological edge to the studio business. And he points to, these big anvil cases that he had purchased to right. put all of his equipment in to give to a cartage guy. So he has, and he, he said to me, he said, that's the psychological edge to the studio business. And right away I go, okay, I guess that's, that's the deal, you know? And so I just, I had these influences early on where I just knew, and I watched friends of mine that were playing in bars that were older than me. Yeah. They were great players. And I, and I looked at them, I go, they're, they're, they have no opportunity in front of them. There's zero opportunity. This is it. This is the top. This is, this is exact. This is where they're going to wind up. That's it. That's great. So yeah. I, I wanted to go further than that. You know. uh, with respect to Jay, you know, I spoke to him ages ago and he said the only time he can do an interview 
was 11.30 at night. I'm like, yeah, you know, that's not working for me. On a, no, no, 11.30 at night on a Sunday. And I'm like, you know, that's all well and good, but, you know. He, not Jay good. has been like that since I can't even tell you. He gets 11 up at 11.30 at he night gets, on a no, Sunday. He gets up at, well. <laughs> on a Sunday, not like 11.30 any time. 11.30 at night on a Sunday. I'm like, I'm not, A, I don't work Sundays for anybody. He's you got know. a work schedule. He gets up. Right. At like, he gets up at six o'clock at night. He's he's six. He's up at six, and he goes to bed at eight in the morning or something. Yeah. Well, hey, right on. Good for him. Oh man, people used to talk about doing sessions for him. Here's the call: four a.m. <laughs> <laughs> but you're playing on you're playing on Al Jarreau's record. Yeah, you yeah. Know, but it's four a.m. I mean, you know. Yeah. That's just the way he is. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know how you live that way, but that's the way he is. I don't know. Anyway. Okay. So, cool. So, so, so it's just to back up. You know, we got sidetracked. So what happens is, is I'm doing that, and then I get, then I get the Seals and Crofts gig. This oh, is, okay. This and, is that. No, 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 no. I'm sorry. It was the DeFranco family. The next gig I get, the, the following touring gig is a guy named Eddie Kendricks. Oh, from who, the Temptations. Yes. Holy who, shit. Dan Sawyer knew about this gig, and he knew the musical director, and he says you got to call this guy Marty Wallace because Dan didn't want to do it. So I, I'm, I, dude, I'm 23 years old. I'm from Burbank, California. Yeah, that probably Glendale, Glendale Burbank, you, right? I get this gig. I've shed all the Eddie Kendricks parts. Boogie down, keep on trucking. Boom, boom, boom. I'm shedding all these parts, right? This guy was freaking great. His records were great. Great. And Excuse great, me. great. And and it was three guys from LA and three guys from from Detroit. Right. And we go we go to the first rehearsal, right? Before the first gig, it I think it was at the Playboy Club in Chicago or something like that. I forget where we were, but we were, we were going to play this show and, you know, and I, I have, my, here I am, I'm 23. Okay. Uriel Jones is playing drums. Who's in the Funk Brothers. Uriel Jones from, you know, the, you know, the movie that came out. Um, sure do. Standing in the Shadows in Motown, I think. Yep. And so Uriel Jones is the drummer. Eddie Willis, who's in the Funk Brothers, is the guitar player. So none of guitar? those guys are around anymore. None of them. Because I'd try to research. Are they, are they all gone? I think so, yeah, because I researched and I was trying to find some of them to come on the show. I'd love to have talked oh, to them. But anyway, so Uriel counts off Boogie Down. <laughs> I had never felt anything like that coming from a drummer in my life. Really? I'm standing, I'm here. This, it was kind of a tight stage. I'm here. There's his drums. Oh my God. It was like, whoa, like, wow. You know, <laughs> that's cool. So anyway, man. so I did that for a long, I did that for a period of time that ended. And then I went and did the seals across gig for a couple of years. And so, so I think once I did, once I finished to answer yeah. your question, once I finished the seals and Crofts gig, I had a lot of money in the bank and I said, okay, I guess I've, I guess I belong to do the, you know, I guess I'm supposed to be doing this. You know? And how was that gig seals and Crofts? They were huge at that time. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, they had a big record out at the time called um, "Get Su Closer." Sum okay, "Summer Breeze" was one of their big hits. Yeah, of our we yeah. played all those man forever. You yeah, know? I did two 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 summer tours with them. Oh, yeah, they were great. They nice were great. guys to work with. Yeah, they were they were really nice. Jimmy Seals was a bit of a bit. Jimmy Seals was really particular about time. As a matter of fact, the way we got the way I got the gig was they had done the um the get closer album so this was you know they had done they had their initial kind of surge right with summer breeze and diamond girl and those things and i think then they, they kind of fell off a little bit and they did this record with this song on it that was big and this woman carolyn willis was singing on it and they had decided that they were going to move on from their touring band the guys in the band were great mike vaccaro was in it scott shelley Kelly Shanahan, they're great players, but they did somehow they decided they wanted to move on. I was doing, and this is an interesting thing because sometimes you do stuff where you're not getting paid. Bill Como, he's a keyboard player, came to me and said he had a band that he had started with Michael Hosick. Michael Hosick was a drummer in the Doobie Brothers in the early days, and Hosick quit the Doobie Brothers to start a band called Bonnaroo, and they had made an album for Warner Brothers which kind of made a little bit of noise, but not a lot. And Warner Brothers, and one of the guys who wrote all of the songs, most of the songs quit the band. 
Hmm. They needed a singer and they needed a guitar player and they needed to cut demos. And so Bill called me and he said, if you want to do this, you know, you'd be in the band if, if, if Warners will sign us. And I say, okay, cool. So we cut these demos at a studio in the San Fernando Valley, which was in the back of Jimmy Seal's house. That's funny. Was, well, it was Jimmy or Dash's. I forget. I think it was Jimmy's pad. So, so we record this stuff and Warners turns it down, but Jimmy and Dash hear it. And they had decided to move on from their band. And they go, the bass player in the band used to work with them, Bobby Lighting. And they said, well, why don't we just get Bobby's band? So, so they call us. We go to rehearsals. This is about Jimmy Seals. We go to rehearsals. Cool. We're playing. And Michael Hasek, who's, grew, who's a good drummer, man, you know, and he's Michael Hasek. He just left the Doobie Brothers. I mean, it's, you know, he's big news, right? But he's kind of like Levon Helm. Loose, you know, yeah. he's got that loose thing, you know, and that's not their music, man. They're tight. They're regimented. Yeah, they're very and, session. And I went yeah. to Jimmy and I said, listen, man, I said, because they fired him. I think, I think they fired him and they were going to fire him. And I went to Jimmy and I said, look, if you want the guy, call Ralph Humphrey. He's the guy. He's going to be, because I had played with Ralph and man, he's just, he's like a machine, you know, he's like, Everything's super tight. So they got Ralph in the thing, and away we went. You know? Wow. So he, and, and that, but he was super particular, man, because he would be like, like if you slowed down, and there's no click track we're playing to, but if you slowed down and rushed or you know, sped up a freaking one BPM, he could feel it. Wow. You know, he'd be like back there, like freaking out, going, eh, it's slowing down, you know, how are you? <laughs> Let me ask you a question. There, yeah. who, if you know this, I, I was just thinking about those songs and it, they're kind of funny songs, you know, the um, like diamond girl, for instance, it, it, if you sit and look at it today, it's very syrupy. It's poppy. You know, back then it was, it was rock and roll it was soft rock, but it was rock yeah. and roll. Yeah. It was a soft rock thing. Yeah. Yeah. But who the guitar solo on that was really good. Who did that? On the Shelton. Record? really yeah louis shelton produced those records you know who you know louis shelton louis he, shelton was his main kick-ass studio guitar player man back in the early late interesting 60s, early 70s. he's in yeah, australia so, now isn't he yeah yeah he, he was their he was their producer i had no idea that is really interesting because there was the, the, it was like uh like George Benson kind of lick on, you know, it was very jazzy, clean, very smooth, man. Really smooth, you know, without yeah. sounding syrupy or anything. Great guitar player, man. Interesting. I did not know that. Yeah, great, man. He played on Last Train to Clarksville, you know, the monkey's tune. And he was yeah, yeah. a friend of, somebody was telling me about the story he tells about it where he, where it sounds like a 12 string and it's not. That's a double track six string up an octave. Oh, okay. Interesting. Now, great, now, yeah, great guitar that. track. Great yeah. guitar track. Yeah, he Louis was an innovator, man. He was, you know, he gave me my first shot. He, you know, they the first record I played on was a live Seals and Cross record called Sudan Village. We did it in 76. And um, and Louis gave me, man, we did, we played it, and then we there was an instrumental track on there that we played, and they had things isolated enough where I could recut my guitar solo, which was cool, you know. And, yeah. And so I did that, and then and then I did another record with him, but uh, with Seals and Cross, you know, he he hired his road band to play on some of the tracks, which was really nice, you know. Yeah. Very cool. He didn't have to do that. No. He could have ca kept calling the Eighteen Cats, but he decided to bring in his road band for a couple of things. That happened a few times with me, you know. But most of the time in this industry, as it seems to me as an outsider that's been involved with it for a while, it is very relationship oriented. And you oh. do call those people yeah. more than any other industry. There is a loyalty, uh, you know, a brotherhood thing there where you'll get as long as you're good. You know, people want to support you and give you a shot, man. You hit the nail on the head. All right. So let me ask, how did you. OK, so after Seals and Crofts. Um, then you started getting sessions yeah. pretty consistently. Right. Okay. So uh, the, the, you want to know the way that went down? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So, so I, I had done the Seals and Crofts, second Seals and Crofts tour. They called me to, to tour again in 78. And I said, no, I'm not going back on the road. And I went, 
I made I made a commitment to myself. I said I'm not I'm not going back on the road. I'm not. I got to stay in town. I had saved my money. I was I was pretty frugal, you know. Good for you. And I and I had a big bank account, and I said I'm going to stay in town. I'm going to live off this bank account, and I'm going to make a go at this session thing. That's awesome. And I wound up I wound up um, uh, playing on a lot of demos. I was down at. Uh, at AM Records all the time with Allie Willis, God bless her soul. She just passed a few, you know, I talked to her, what, a few days before she passed away. Allie wrote Boogie Wonderland, September, you know, and, and I was, I was playing on song demos for her, um, Franny Goldie, uh, you know, all these different writers. Um, and, um, you know, at, 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 at ATV Music and at, at uh, AM, and you know, so I'm we're playing on these demos for people. And I've been working with a guy named Don Costa, a uh, um, got an orchestrator that worked with Frank. That's a whole nother story, but anyway, I'm, a, I'm playing on these demos, you know, and I'm like trying to get my skill set up, you know. So we're doing, I'm doing whatever I can do. And back then, you know, they hired songwriters had to have publishing houses had to have copies of the music, copies of songs to show to artists. So they had a budget to actually pay guys like me a little bit of bread. We didn't make a lot of money. Pay them a little bit of bread to come in and just knock out, you know, you'd get there, be like chord charts and you just, just like sessions, but you're not making any bread, you know, yeah. you just six tunes in a day, you know, like bang away and knock them out, you know? And, and so what? my skill set was getting kind of good, but yeah, go ahead. What was, if you're comfortable, you have to talk about yours, but what was the average compensation for something like that for a session, for a demo? Ballpark. Oh, no. I mean, it was like 25 bucks a song or something. Yeah. Okay. I mean, I remember, I remember doing, I remember doing some of those sessions er, earlier than that. I was doing stuff, you know, back when I'm still playing weddings and things, I'm doing stuff for 10 bucks a song, you know? Wow. I remember, wow. I remember doing a session one time for a guitar player. I mean, for a writer, it was literally $10 a song. And I'm wow. at this, and I'm at Don Costa's studio in Hollywood with these writers they assigned. And, and they really liked this one particular song they had. So they brought in their main engineer to like, you know, the engineer that worked with Don, who Don wrote an arrangement for Frank, you know, and, and they said, we want to get this demo right. So, so they hired the kids to come in. I'm probably 22 or something, you know. And, and, and we go in there, and the guy goes, your guitar's out of tune. And I, guess I said, yeah, I'm making 10 bucks a song. If you want in tune, call Larry Carlton. Oh, you, know? you said that. Oh, Holy yeah. shit, oh, right yeah. on. Yeah, right. Good I said, for you. Yeah. Yeah, I'm making 10 bucks a tune, man. It's going to be, a, I'm sorry, it's out of tune, but uh, that's what you get for 10 bucks, I guess. That's hilarious. So what did they say? <laughs> it was probably the wrong thing to say. Of course it was, but it was hilarious. I wouldn't recommend it. Well, you I don't, want I in tune, call Larry was, Carlton. Yeah, I said that. That's I great. I said, man. hey, if you want in tune, call Larry Carlton. I, that's I was amazing. trying to be Larry. I'm trying to be Larry, and I ain't coming close yet. You know? That's great, man. <laughs> That's I like telling that's, your teacher to go fuck herself after she tells you to stop talking that, in class. I think that's when Graydon, when I told Graydon and he said, okay, bring your guitar over here and I'm going to teach you how to intonate your guitar. Yeah. So that's he funny, showed man. me that and off I went. You know? okay. Wow. <laughs> anyway. Yeah. Um, where were we? <laughs> not, we're, we're just where we need to be. <laughs> wow. Let me just process that. That is pretty cool. That's great. Um, okay. So talk about, I'm just going to put some names out there and tell me how you got the gig and if any kind of cool or interesting story about working with them. Uh, Donna Summer, because she was the biggest thing going. Right. And, and that song was one of the things that made her. Yeah. <laughs> That's the one that guitar players hit me up about. Um, the way that happened, man, was, uh, and that was 84. So I had been doing a lot of sessions, man. I was in the throw of the thing pretty deep, you know. But, you know, I'll tell you, I'm doing a session for a guy named Steve Barry, who was the guy that was, who had guy that really got me started. My, this is the producer my brother was signed to. Oh, okay. And, and I had become Steve's number one call. Awesome. So there I am. I get on this session and there's, a, and, and, Steve used an arranger keyboard player by the name of Michael Amartian. 
Oh God. I, Michael O'Martian played on a bunch of, you know, he played on the Steely Dan records and I had done all this work with Michael. I had, you know, we had done the song Heartlight. I mean, I'm, I'm sorry, uh, Arthur's theme. We had done that. He had hired me to play on a bunch of contemporary Christian records that he had, was producing. And his own contemporary, he was a Christian. He was a Christian. He was doing these contemporary Christian records. Mm. So I was playing on his records. I'm doing all this work with him. Anyway, so we show up at the date and, um, and, and we're, we do the session for Steve. But I had a, I had an octave, I had just gotten this octave divider by Boss, right? The octaver. And, and I'm sitting there with my rig and I'm kind of mucking around with it, you know, I'm kind of farting around, you know, it, in between takes, you know? Yeah. They're listening to the track, whatever. And I'm like trying to dial this thing in, see what, you know, how it sounds and stuff like that. <clears throat> Omar. At the end of the session, he says, hey, guys, you got to hear this track I'm working on for Donna. He was producing her album. And he says, you got to hear this track. So he puts on this, this music track, this music bed. I think it was like the, some of the synths, the synth bass part and some drum machine. Dude, that things. was heavy, heavy. All that songs back then, that was a lot of synth, man. Yeah. And anyway, so he plays the song, had some guide vocal or something like that. But really, literally, like it was, we heard it. It was just in the demo kind of form. And we were like, oh, dude, like this is going to be huge, man. You knew, you knew right away that song was, this was going to be big. Yeah. So anyway, so, so my phone rings at my pad and it's Omar's assistant. And she books me to play on this thing at Lion's Share in uh, Hollywood. And she says, make sure you bring that pedal that you were <laughs> messing around with at the session that you did with Steve. So he, Omar heard me playing with this octave thing. That got you the gig, man. Well, kind of like that. Because I learned that from Jay. Jay said, dude, you always have to have new sound, new sound, new sound all the time. you got to say, hey, dig this new thing. I mean, they, they love that. And I wasn't really going after it, but Omar picked up on it. So anyway, I show up at the session and, uh, and I had already worked with him a bunch. And so, you know, he puts that track up with John Guest, the engineer. I think it was John. Might have been Terry Christian. And, um, and I'll never forget it. I mean, I'm set up and, uh, okay, what are we going to do? And he listens to the track and he sat there with a piece of manuscript paper and he writes out that figure. He writes it out and he throws it on my stand and he goes, play that. <laughs> and I'm like, okay. And I, you know, I sh I'm shedding, you know, okay, cool. We do it. We double track it. He goes, okay, get the octave box. So we do that octave box. So we double track it with the octave box. And I do the rhythm parts. And this is analog tape. So this, it's not cut paste. Yeah, this yeah. isn't like you play it once and you can just du you duplicate it. Yeah, this yeah. is like you got to go through the whole freaking song track. Okay, now we're going to do the whole thing double tracked. And now we're going to do a whole octave. You know, now we got to do the bridge. Da, do, 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 da. I can't believe how loud my guitar is in the bridge, man. I freaking cranked it. So anyway, so then, so we're like, okay, cool. And you have to understand something, man. I'm not a guitar player. When I would do solos on records, I would sing, I would do them in pieces. And I would, I'm, you know, if I just sat and played my guitar, I'm going to play a bunch of blues licks. But it, this is the 80s, man. It wasn't blues guitar. They were not at for. all. They were looking for Jeff Baxter and Luke was doing his thing. And yeah, it was all this kind of speed and this kind of very melodic thing happening, major key stuff, you know. And so this is a minor key. But I'm like, we get two hours and 40 minutes into the session. It's a three hour day. We're two hours and 40 minutes into all the rhythm parts. The thing sounded the bomb, dude. It sounded great, right? And Omar says, Gary Herbig walks in because he has to put the saxophone solo on it. Mm -hmm. And he says, oh, yeah, hey, Gary. He says, hey, Marty, we got to put a solo on it. <laughs> I got 20 minutes 20 to put minutes. solo, which is, Think which, quick. you know, which I guess is cool. But anyway, people have asked me about that solo. So I'm going to tell you how the whole thing went. Yeah. He had rented a Marshall amp. I, at the time, I had a Roland JC120 I was using. Okay. And, and that's what I was playing through, a Les Paul with a JC120 and a pedals and stuff is what I was using, overdrive pedals and things I was getting my overdrive from. But I had that chorusing, 
Now, JC120 was a stereo amp. It was one of the first ones, and it really got me started, which is a whole other story. But I did a session for Seals and Crofts where I, I mean, for uh, Yvonne Elliman, where that was a co huge component, and that got my session career going. But anyway, Omar, I've rented this Marshall. You keep saying Omar. You're talking about Michael Omar. Oh, Michael Omar. Yeah, yeah, okay. Sorry. It's, no, no, no. I just want to clarify. Yeah, and, and yeah that's Omar. So... <laughs> So he had rented this Marshall to do this solo. I, he goes, hey, man, we got this Marshall. You got to plug into that. Okay, well, cool. So I plug into the Marshall, and I got 20 minutes. And literally, I go, okay, how am I going to start this thing? And I, I, used to, I used to have the engineer play the track. I would say, play the track. And I wouldn't play. I would hear things in my head. Sure. And, and then I'd find it on the guitar, and i go, okay, punch in. Then drop this in, right? So the opening of that solo is a sideward, sideways version of Layla. Huh, how did you come That's Layla. She works hard for money is Yeah, whatever. I mean, it's, it's, it's Layla, it's Layla, sideways. Yeah. I forget which one is which now, but no, it's I can't. that. You know? Interesting. And I get to that spot. That's as far as I get. Stop tape. <clears throat> okay, now what? And I go, play the tape. And I'm listening and I'm thinking, Peg by Graydon. <laughs> that Ben, do you, do you, yeah. that thing. I go, oh yeah, double stop, Peg by Graydon. So I get... I do like this double stop bendy thing, you know. Now I'm about three quarters of the way through it, and I'm like, stop again, you know. And then for some reason, I heard that little chromatic thing, you know, and then off, and that just was just kind of got very stock after that. You know? did, it, did it ever get uh, when you had a perform? Did you perform that live ever? Um, oh, and I never played with her live. I just oh, did okay. the record. Yeah. And that must have been, it. yeah, that's probably good because she had all these influences. It would have been, I bet it would have been hard to not think of these songs, to not start riffing on Layla, for example, instead of, you know what I mean? That, because that was the inspiration. <laughs> yeah. I mean, <coughs> you know, I, mean, I don't know. Yeah. Maybe, yeah. You know, very but cool, good, man. That was a good album. And, and Graydon was, Graydon was doing a lot of that record. Jay was Jay was Omar's number one guy. Okay. Jay, Jay Omar was calling Jay and Luke, and I think Luke was probably on the road with Toto. Right. Um, this is '84, I think, maybe '83. So he was probably on the road with Toto. Landau hadn't really happened yet, and and Graydon was still Graydon was starting to phase out of sessions because he was doing so much uh, production work. So I was kind of by the default kind of guy, you know, like you couldn't get Jay, call me. And so I wound up doing a lot of the tracks on her album, on that album. You know? That's great, man. It's great yeah, record. Me and, me and Rick, yeah. Uh, talk about, what did you do with Eddie Money? Oh, man. <laughs> Dude, you're asking the right question. I, you, if you want the right, if you want the stories, man, I got them. Man. You certainly do, man. Here's the Eddie Money story. <laughs> I'm working with a, a drummer named Gary Ferguson. We're doing all those demos together. I had known Gary since we were playing a day. You guys, you know Dave Benoit, the jazz keyboard player? I don't. You know who he is? No. He's, he's one of those, um, you know, jazz keyboard guys. He's had a career doing that forever. He's not, like, related to Tad Benoit, is he? I don't think so. Yeah, okay. That's only a bit of But anyway, <laughs> I've known Gary. I knew this drummer, Gary Ferguson, since we were, you know, 19 years old, playing in Dave Benoit's garage. <clears throat> we had done all these demos together. And now Gary was working. He was doing some big, he was playing on like, you know, he was up and he was doing stuff that was, he was kind of rocking, you know, he was on the kind of rock end of things. He's a big rock, like a really good rock drummer, you know? So anyway, he gets the call to do this, to play on some of these tracks. He's, he's Eddie Money's road, road drummer. That's what okay. he is. He's playing on, he's doing his gig on the road. Is he in New York? Eric, he's not a New York guy, no. is he? No, no, this Eddie's living out, Eddie's living up in San Francisco, I think. You know, okay. Time. So, um, so Gary Malabar, who was, who did all the prior records, um, w uh, was on some of the, some of the tracks for this No Control record, but Gary was going to do some of them. 
Gary goes into rehearsals. The, the, the engineer is a guy named Andy Johns. <laughs> Huge, right? Yeah. Wait a minute. And, so this, you were on the No Control record. Yeah. That was a great record, man. Holy yeah. shit. So, wow. Yeah. So, so anyway. That was so, the shit, man. Fergie's doing, Fergie's doing this thing. And they've got a guy named Jimmy Lyon, who, who was Eddie's guitar player, who's a great guitar player. But for some reason, Ferguson goes to bat for me. And he says to Andy, and Tom Dowd is producing the record. Oh, wow. Right? Tom Dowd, who does the Clapton records and, and Brothers. engineered the Cream records. I mean, he's like Tom freaking Dowd, you know? Yeah. So anyway, I, Gary calls me and he says, hey, man, I'm down here at Leeds rehearsal. And I've told these guys about you. And Gary literally said to them, hey, you need to call this guy because we work really, really well together. So, so I... I, I, I go cool and I send my gear over to Leeds and I show up and um, and they said we're gonna play this song called Shaken <laughs> right what a song that and the and cover I, song oh. so they so somehow I mean they had been running it or something you know and I don't know if I don't think Jimmy was there I, I forget how the whole thing went down but but anyway um, uh, they are going to play that song and I hear it and I go, okay. And I, I, I did a video that I put on my blog about this, but I'll, I'll show you again. Um, if I can. Yeah, do it, man. This is, that you, is that what you used in SG? No, no. I, this is, uh, I had a Les Paul at the time. By the way. You, I just happen you, to have this handy. You're, you, look, you look good. You take care of yourself. Man. Cause I'm I'm thinking about these dates that you're saying. You're you're in pretty good shape. You do you take care of yourself? I guess. Yeah, man. You you look like you good look after good genetics, man. Good, good for genetics. you. Good. So it's shaking, right? Yeah. And so then funny. we're get, and then the chorus. Right. Can yeah. you hear that? Totally. Right? Yeah. So anyway, now I had been cut. The, the reason I was working as a studio musician, the reason I was getting calls is I was pretty creative in the rhythm world. My, I had good time. My dad had great rhythm time. I had really good time. I had great. I, I learned it. I mean, I, it was innate, but I cultivated it because Graydon told me that was the, what you needed to cultivate. You had to have really good time. So when I played with Eddie Kendricks, keep on trucking. Yeah. I mean, I could do it, you know. Um, you know, I'm not a great soloist. I, I mean, I, I never spent a lot of time, you know, learning how to be some cool soloist because I knew that the money was in rhythm guitar. Absolutely. So I learned, you know, so so I got my acoustic skills together, and I anyway, but I had. I knew that if I was going to get this gig, I couldn't go. <laughs> da, 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 da. I couldn't do that. I mean, I could, but that's not going to get me the gig. Yeah. I need to do something at this rehearsal that catches them off guard. So I think to myself, A chord. I got these notes. A2, right? Right? So I play over the A chord, I go, I go. So you just play little arpeggios around it. Yeah. Right, with a Marshall. Right, so I do that and it's like, yeah, you know, you it's have different. Fat yeah, it fattens it up quite a bit. Yeah, yeah, it's a different thing. Now they do the record, and and it, it's not all that audible in the record, you know, because you got to have, you know, you got to yeah. have that. But it was it was a piece that kind of got me. I think I they kind of went, oh yeah, this guy, you know. So they hire me to do that's the, a, to do that's the record, awesome, you know. And and um, I mean, I'm in that video of shaking, you know, the one. Are you the, really? Oh, oh yeah, I'm the guy I'm gonna in go the red T-shirt. I'm gonna go watch it now. You know. Dan Rather, Dan Rather has these interviews called uh, The Big Interview. Yeah. Right? And he interviewed Eddie Money. And the first thing, 
They go, he gives the Eddie money spiel, you know, and he talks about this, this record being kind of Eddie's pinnacle moment. I didn't really realize that or that's it, what he did. It, it kind of was. Kind of like the pinnacle moment. And, and they go, and they go, you know, and they're showing these little clips and stuff. And then they go bang and it's me and Eddie. That's really I'm, funny. It's me. I'm, I'm playing my guitar and he's singing shaking and they're <laughs> crack me up, man. Yeah, this was, that was his big his that was his man that was one of those things where uh, a guy i once interviewed um rich eckhart who's toby keith's guitar player and he told me about a meeting he was hanging out with leslie west one time yeah and leslie said to him you only need one hit song <laughs> <laughs> and but that was eddie's you know mississippi queen and it carried him it's how many years i mean he passed recently i think right yeah yeah yeah, yeah. but i mean it that you only need one hit song, you know, that was, that was, you know. Well, he had some great, man. He made some great records, man. Andy yeah. Johns, Andy Johns was great. Great team. He sounded like he had a really good team behind him. Oh, man, him. it was, yeah. yeah, it was really something. But I got, I got to tell, look, I got to tell you the one, I got to tell you one story about the yeah. sessions. Okay? Yeah. So we're doing these dates and it sounded incredible. And it, we had done, I don't know which ones we had done, but I'm, I'm, we probably did Think I'm In Love. That was the first single off that album. Mm. you know and i had a kind of a major guitar part in that and um anyway so so there i am i show up you know whatever day three or you know i, don't, I forget how many dates it was but the guitar so part on there was pretty i i know i i hadn't heard that yeah it was a two double stop the, yeah you know, middle string kind of thing you know but really electric you know very exciting part yeah it yeah was it good. was a you know that's what you got to do man you yeah gotta, man that's the role of the guitar player. Come up with something cool and creative that, you know, that's why Lukather was Lukather because yeah. he could do it on a dime. He could just, yeah. he was super creative, man. He'd come up with the absolute right thing to do every time fast, you know, yeah. and he would pl could play those solos that were him. But anyway, so, so there I am, I'm doing this gig with Tom Dowd, Eddie, my, uh, Eddie and Andy. And I'm like, I'm, you know, I'm digging it. I'm, you know, I'm pretty comfortable, you know, doing what I'm doing. I'm confident, you know, it's all sounding great. And I get there 10 o'clock in the morning, uh, you know, and I'm tuning, you know, like setting up, you know, my stuff was there, but I'm kind of tuning guitars and making sure everything's cool. And Tom Dowd comes out of the control room. But in the, I'm, I'm in the, I'm in the tracking room by myself. I'm there early. And Dowd comes over and he says, Hey, Eric is coming out of rehab. He's up in he's up in Minneapolis and he's coming out of rehab and he's not in the best way. Eric Clapton. Yeah, I knew you. I figured. And, <laughs> yeah. and he says, he says, how would you like to do his? He says, I think I need to. I need to have someone there that would, you know. That he can kind of bounce off of. You know? <clears throat> how'd you like to do his next record? Holy and crap. Like, and I'm like. Tom, that I would be absolutely honored. I mean, I can't even tell you what that would mean to me, you know, to do that. He's been my hero for, you know. So anyway, so we finished the sessions. A couple of weeks later, my phone rings. It's Tom's assistant. Marty, Tom wanted me to call you and check your availability for August, blah, blah, blah. Here's this three week blo block or something. I'm gonna go to Montserrat and make this record. And I go, hey, look, I'm good. You know, like, I would love to do it. Tell him I'm open. I'll just, you know, I'll clear out whatever. I mean, I'm just ready to go. Yeah. Cool. Two weeks later, his phone rings. Uh, they've moved the sessions to October. Can you, how's October looking for you? You Will, will you be available? And I'm like, yeah, I'm available. Yeah. <laughs> you know? yeah. It doesn't matter. I don't care when you want to do these. I'm going to be around, you know. Yeah. So anyway, so that was the last phone call. Never heard from them again. And um, the record comes out. The record's called Money and Cigarettes. And it's Al it's um, Ry Cooter and, uh, and Albert Lee. So I got bumped, right? Wow. Now, I saw Albert a few years ago because I kind of knew him back in L.A. days. You know, I ran, I, a friend of mine was playing with him. And I went to a show. This is, I don't know, three or four years ago. I went to his Albert Lee gig, you know. Well, we all went out to eat afterwards, you know, and I said to him, I said, hey, dude, listen, you know that Money Cigarettes record, man? Dowd asked me to play on that, man, and I'm like so bummed, man, that I, you know, didn't get the gig, and, you know, 
I said, but you know, what can I do? I got bumped by you. Yeah. And, and yeah. Ry Cooter, right. you know, like, what, what are you going to do? You know, of course. I mean, yeah. So, uh, so he goes, you know, he says, he says, Eric had no songs. So they figured we got to get Rye in and cause Rye had tunes and we can, you know, but I'm oh, sure so he was look, totally sure, unprepared. Sure, yeah. He had just, he was a mess, man. He was a mess when they did that record. He was, wow. cause everybody was still drinking and doing stuff. And he was like out trying to be sober. And it, it was, you know, I read his book. It wasn't a good time. Yeah, I, his book was wonderful. It was a yeah, really, really well, good. Yeah, really, really well good. Written book. Yeah. Did you know? Anyway, I, I I just wow. missed. You know. The almost Eric <laughs> yeah, Clapton session. Yeah. Wow. Um. Tell me also about Fogarty. What was that like, and how was playing yeah. with John? <clears throat> that was, you know, um, John had done an album called. Um, I had the zombie, I, I the zombie song, right? Which stiffed, right? But it had some good stuff on it. The title song was pretty good. Yeah, um, and John Robinson had played drums on it. Neil right. Steubenhaus had played bass, and Alan Pla Pasquid played organ, keyboard. So they were in rehearsals, and John Fogarty said, "Listen, <clears throat> we need to get another guitar player." So, you know, call the guy. So they called. They called Dan Huff, who was hot in LA at the time. This is 86. Hell of Dan a player, was, man. Dan was the hottest cat. And, uh, and Dan turned it down. And they called Mike Landau, who was super hot. And Landau turned it down. So I don't know. They're doing so many dates, I guess they didn't want to go on the road. Yeah. <clears throat> so um, then they, they had called, they had asked... Uh, Dean Parks hmm. and my phone rings and it's Andy Brower. I don't know if you know who Andy Brower is. He did. Uh, I do. Why do I know that name? He did. He had the Carnage rental business. All of the guitar players were with Andy Brower. Right. Everybody. I was with him. Luke was with him. Landau, Puff, Dean, everybody was with this guy. He was the Carnage rental guy. All your gear was with him and they, he'd take all your stuff to session. I, I, that's how I know him. You know what? Somebody actually, uh, Andy Brock. Yeah, I, I know who he is. I know exactly who you're talking about. So anyway, sorry, go ahead. So, so my phone rings and it's Brower. And he tells me, he says, hey, he says, dude, this is your gig, man. This is this is where you live. You should be doing this gig. This is like, you know, so, but they've offered it to Dean and Dean's on the fence. And I go, thank you. And I got off the phone and I called John Robinson, who I knew. I had done sessions with John. And I said, hey, Jr." what's going on with this Fogarty gig, man? I'd like you, you know, and he goes, Oh, Marty. He says, can you come down here? <laughs> I think, I, I don't know if it was the next day or that night or something like that. He says, can you come down and play? And I'm like, yeah. So I had Browers take all my stuff to the place. We played John dug it. And Steuben house pulls me aside. And he says, listen, we offered the gig to Dean. We're waiting to hear what he says. If Dean says he's going, it's his gig. If he says he's not going, it's your gig. Great. So, and Dean didn't do it. Dean turned it down. Why so do you think so many went. guys turn that down? I mean, Fogarty's a major, you know, I'm assuming you that know, it's, the pay it's, on a gig like that's going to be good. The travel's going to be good. The pay was stupid. <laughs> yeah, that's what I'm was, the pay was unbelievable. Yeah, that's but, what I'm saying. No, but here's the thing, man. Here's the thing, it, in LA, if you're a studio musician in LA, you know what you don't want to do? Leave mm. LA. You uh, don't okay. want to leave LA. Dan Huff was probably doing three dates a day, six days okay. a week. So it's the same as Nashville kind he's, of thing. Yeah, or you, at Nashville he's used making, to be. Yeah. He's making serious money on the road. Right. I mean, I mean, doing in, sessions. In sessions Landau's, yeah. Landau's the same way. And then yeah. on the, you know, plus, Dean's the same way. Dean was doing all the TV film stuff too. So, yeah. you know, they're giving up a lot to go out on the road on a bus. Right. This is not, this is not 2003 when everybody's going, give me a gig on the bus because there's no sessions. Yeah. This is 1986 when they're still burning. Yes. Everybody's still ripping, you know. Gotcha. And, you know, so they turn it down. Good for me. You yeah. Know, I was yeah. lucky, but I was fourth call. <laughs> so what? 
What kind of hang in there? What was uh, anything? What was Fogarty like? Good to work with. Great. Yeah, that John, was probably a tough time for him John, too. I would imagine. John, yeah, he was. John was cool, and and we got on. We got on really good. You know, we got on really good because because I you know I, I'm not a. Alan Pasqua, Jr. and Steubenhaus are serious jazz players. They're ser- man. These guys can play freaking bebop, old time school bebop jazz. Man, they can rip it. Man, they're really good at that thing. You know, I'm not. And yeah. they'd be at they'd be at sound check and they'd be playing. You know, yeah. You know, and Warming I'm waiting up with to play Miles some freaking. I'm, I'm waiting to play some freaking triads. You know. Yeah. And and so John and I kind of got on because I was much more akin to his thing than they were. You know? Okay. He liked him, but at the same time, he did feel like he felt like the music was a little bit. Uh, I don't know. It wasn't funky. It wasn't. It wasn't credence enough. I think you know. But I yeah. mean, we didn't do. He didn't. Do, the the weird thing about the tour was he didn't do any credence material. He wouldn't play one credence Clearwater song. Well, he was and, pretty and, uh, acrimonious at. Uh, at that right. time, I'm pretty sure. And so, so the ticket sales started going down, down, down after everybody realized what the set was. The set yeah. list was all new stuff. And um, but what's ironic about it is, is he wound up playing on Farm Aid or one of those things. You know, six months after we finished touring, he's on television playing Proud Mary and stuff <laughs> because they told him he had to. They go, you can't just get out there and do center field, man. Yeah, you got to do. Well, you know, you got to do Proud Mary, you got to do, you know. Who'll Stop the Rain, Who'll something. Who'll Stop the Rain, yeah. you know, you got to do those songs. And he did, and he's been doing them ever since. And he's written some amazing, just amazingly, amazing songs, man. Yeah. Really good. He's a real good cat, man. I, I like John a lot, man. I wish we could have kept working, you know, but he does his records and, you know, he plays all the guitar, so pointless to hire somebody else, you know. Does, was he playing that Black Ass Paul, uh, Les Paul that he always you always see him with i think he did i think he did have the black one yeah, yeah i think so he had a bunch of them you know he had brower was hooking him up and doing all kind, you know getting him all kinds of guitars and you know he played a strat had a strat maybe a couple of les pauls on that gig very cool man yeah so let me ask you this if it's yeah. possible to answer thank you those are some great stories man <laughs> I, mean, uh, I got a lot of top three <laughs> sessions you've done and why Wow. Just go with you. I know it's really tough. Just go with your knee jerk reaction. Wow. I mean, God, that's so hard because I know because you know, how do you, I know it's how, like saying, you, what's your favorite book? You, what's your favorite kid? I mean, you have to go back and remember, you know, look, obviously the Eddie money thing. I mean, that was, because that was rocking, man. That was like, you know, doing what I did. There was a lot of pop stuff, man. You're playing on Helen Reddy records, you know, you're like, you know, and you get a chance to really dig into some, you know, I got my Marshall four by 12 and I'm freaking, you know, hitting power chords and stuff. So yeah, I'll definitely the Eddie, the Eddie experience, you know, Helen um, Reddy had some great hits, but I can, I know what you're saying. It's not, yeah, you're not digging like, in on yeah. your Marshall on, on Helen Reddy songs. Yeah. Um, I would have to say the Eddie record, um uh there was an out you know and then there's kind of probably more obscure stuff like like i did an album with a guy named michelle colombier who was an orchestrator and an absolute hero of mine he was just phenomenal he passed away about i don't know seven eight years ago and i got a call to to play on on his on his uh solo record called old fool back on earth and i was just he did a record when I was a kid called Wings that everybody loved. It was an obscure record, but all musicians knew about it. It was like a musician's record. And it was like, you know, and so doing those sessions, I was honored to be getting the call, you know, to do those. Um, and then I suppose the other, the other sessions, the, the other project that I did that I would have to say I was absolutely just honored to be on was a John Denver record that I did in 84. Look, I mean, look, hang on. The Super Tramp records, man. Brother, where are you bound? No, I come, that was some great, <laughs> that was some, those are some great sessions. I mean, look, the top three, 
that's you know i'm i mean yeah brother where you been i mean i don't know i, I can't i probably got to put that i got to put no control brother where you bound and and the michelle record i suppose you know but i could throw the john denver record in there because he was john denver and because roger nichols called me to do it roger nichols engineered the steely dan records oh, okay. he thought enough of my play he, and he worked for michael O'Marty. He thought enough of my playing to call me and say, you need to put, I, I need you to play on this John Denver record. And you know who the band was? Jerry Sheff on bass, Glenn Harden on piano, James Burton on guitar. Oh shit. I'm getting called to play. Like I'm being requested <laughs> to play with James Burton That's by the cool. producer to play on an album next to James Burton. And what, I mean, how do you, how do you top that? You, you, you know. <laughs> what, what was John like? Nice guy? Uh, Denver? John Denver? Yeah. John Denver was the greatest person that I ever worked for. Really? Yeah. That's so nice, man. He was just, I mean, look, I, look I, I hate to say it that way. It doesn't mean to mean say that anybody well, you're not saying it, but betrayed. You're not saying that. You're not but saying John that. was an absolute special human being. It, he was, and and we had some things in common that, that we'll probably get into a little later in the interview. But but he was, he just had this aura about him, man. He had this thing that was like, <clears throat> I don't know how to describe yeah. it, you know. And we we did. I played live with him. I did a bunch of live dates with him after this record came out. And I wish we could have done more. Boy, his organization was first class. Everything with top freaking notch. Everything, hotels, dope, pay, the way they treated you. The whole thing was just like it was just. You know, he treated everyone so good. That's nice. And he was man. such a nice guy, and not he, he wasn't not just nice. He was. He was brilliant and had this thing about him that was incredible. My, he met my wife. We did a, uh, one of the shows we did down in Orange County at this, you know, wherever we were, Orange County Bowl or some big, you know, huge place. And he meets my wife and he goes, he loved my wife. He goes, you got to come on the road with us. Like, you, you got to come to on. your are wife? You, yeah. He goes, are, you, are you coming on the tour? Come on, you got to come out on the tour. And my wife's really sweet. She's wonderful. People just love her, of course, because, you know, she's the best. And, and, uh, and, and he's like, you know, yeah, you gotta come, you gotta come out with us. You know, she was, our, our son Ian was, uh, was just born. So, you know, he was five months old or something. I forget, you know, but it was like, that's, no, I don't think I can. She be probably would have loved road. coming out on tour and staying yeah, with a five month road, old. You know? <clears throat> yeah, John Denver. It would have been was, easier. John Denver was great. Dolly was, Dolly Parton was, uh, I did two records with her. Um, and, you know, she was a uh, hoot, man. <laughs> We did this album called Burlap and Satin, and it was me and Dan Huff. And uh, man, we would take these breaks and and we'd sit down and just talk with Dolly. You know, she'd be she loved hanging out with the band. You know, talking about stuff. And you know, she was a she was. I mean, you know, it's funny, man, because I'll tell you something. When you get to that level, when you get to the level where you're a Dolly Parton, you're a John Dove, you're a Neil Diamond, you know. It, it, these people are so nice, but they are don't... so nice. They're just the nicest people in the world. They, they, they have such incredibly huge careers that I think they've gone beyond thankful. And they're just into like Uber thanks or something like, how am I so lucky to be in the position I am? You know, but don't, <laughs> don't you find whether it's music anything don't you find the people that are the most successful are also the kindest people uh, that's been my experience it, it, much. it's kind of a myth that people have that this money changes you they're assholes my experience has been and that's a myth i grew up with and i have found as an adult that is completely inaccurate and it's a story told by people who don't have access to this inf to, to accurate information it's like you know an old wives tale but my experience in in any endeavor the most successful people are generally really freaking nice 
It's almost a vetting process. You can't be, I'm sure there's some assholes. There's always assholes, but by and large, they're the minority, you know? No, I, I, I totally agree. I mean, I think the people in the music industry, I, I tell my students at Berkeley, I says, look, nobody, you go to, you go do a recording session in Los Angeles. There is not one person in that building that's bummed out. Yeah. They're, they're all happy. They're all so happy to be there. They're just, ha they're just ecstatic to be involved in whatever is going down in that building at that time, you know? And, and, you know, but what I have found is that people that are, that are, <clears throat> you know, that have maybe had a little bit of success and are still trying to get, you know, into an upper level kind of arena, they can be really problematic. Mm. Those are the ones that are, that are a drag because, because they're, they, they want it so much and they, you know, they're frustrated and stuff, you know, so you can, you know. Yeah. They're coming from a perspective of what they don't have as opposed yeah. to. Yeah. what they've been fortunate to have, which anybody can come from that perspective of hey, no matter what your situation is, if just a slight attitude change of, Hey, this is, I'm so happy to have X, whatever X is for you. you right. Know? Right. Uh, you then, so it, everything's doing great. You leave the session world to teach and to move across the country, which is, you know, pretty much a total life change. What prompted those things to happen? Well, a couple of things. When I was with Eddie Kendricks back when I was a kid, I, I played a, a club in Boston for a week called Paul's Mall. And I stayed at the airport Hilton and I rented a car and I drove up the coast in Massachusetts. And I was like, wow, I'm from Burbank, <laughs> concrete, San Fernando Valley. Okay. And I'm driving around and it's June and the trees are lush and the whole, the beach is pristine and it's just, you know, and then I'm in town and it's a college town and, and, and it's a, it's a really kind of a small, but very, you know, dense urban environment. Yeah. And I'm like walking around going, man, this is not like Los Angeles at all. So I always kind of felt like, wow, what a cool place. Boston I, in general. Yeah. And yeah. when I, when I was on the road, when I would, was on tour, in my twenties, I would go to places and I'd go, man, this is such a much hipper place than LA. I, I never felt like LA was, I mean, it's my home, but I would go places. I'd go to Toronto, I'd go to Atlanta, I'd go to, you know, Boston, you go to, um, you know, outside of DC. And I don't know, there was something about these other areas that the urban thing, that you don't have in the San Fernando Valley existed. And I, and I, I just found it appealing. I meet my wife when I'm touring with Seals and Crofts. She was a college student. And I come to, I meet her in Hawaii of all places. She was an exchange student and I was on the road with Seals and Crofts. That's really cool. Oh yeah, it was crazy. <laughs> and so, so years, a few years later, you know, I mean, we kind of had stayed in touch and stuff, but she wanted to move into Los Angeles. But the fact that she was from Massachusetts, I always kind of, for some reason, uh, had in my mind, you know, I wonder if someday maybe we would wind up back there. So long, to, so so yeah. the way the whole thing happened was, was we're now into the '90s. Um, rap happens. Nirvana happens. Yeah. Changes the record industry. I had played on a ton of pop R&B records. I had played on a ton of pop rock records. Pop rock music was gone. Yeah. Hair band music was done. R and B pop was 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 on the shelf. The record companies were going, I need a rap record and I need Nirvana. So all of a sudden, my session thing is like heading south and so are a lot of guys, man. That's Absolutely. when everybody. That's when you had the mass exodus to Nashville. That's why the Nashville country records sound like they're L.A. pop records, because all those pop guys from the '80s moved to Nashville and they started playing on country records. Yes, you know? 100 percent. So, so what happened was I, I'm I'm doing this TV show called Roundhouse, which was great and it was kind of a lifesaver, and that was cool. And it's '92, '93 into '94. But session world, man, is not happening, but digital is happening. And I go, okay, 
I'm do I now I'm writing music for a, a a company that's doing music for television. I'm I'm recording cues at my house, and I'm driving a DAT tape down to the office. Now I have these relationships. I had a couple of companies I was working for, and that had started to become more of what I was doing. You Lic know, licensing, not li uh, licensing. licensing. Yeah. Okay. Yep. So they're so you saying they're requesting music from me. And okay. They're saying you know record this music and give it to us and we'll place it in television. And it was happening. So I'm like, I have this relationship. And I start to say, well, I can, you know, I can live anywhere because I can do it and put it in a FedEx box. Yeah. <laughs> and then I say, I should probably open up my recording studio to outside projects to make some more bread because the session thing was on the wane. Then I thought, you know, I really don't want people from the San Fernando Valley coming to my house. Not real keen on that. Um, and and why or, was that? I don't know because, this. Because man, it was gangster world at the time. Oh, was it? Okay. Oh man, gangster time. This was the early '90s, man. This is when, like, in the valley, people were getting shot. There were kids that were, you know, I mean, it was bad, man. Yeah. It was. It was a bad. It was. It was crazy stuff happening in LA and I had two kids and I'm going, okay, wait a minute, man, wait a <laughs> second. What are we going to do here? So my wife and I started talking about leaving the area that we lived because there was some stuff going on where we were and it was a little freaky. And, sh and we were talking about moving further West. And I said, Hey, what about moving back East? You know, and she didn't want to go, but I, I wound up, she wanted to stay in LA and I, but I wound up doing all this research and I said, Hey, there's this college back there. I wonder if I could get a gig teaching at this college because I'm look now I'm looking long term. I'm going okay. I'm a guitar player. Cool. You know, session world's kind of going away. Huh? What else can happen? Well, I can produce projects out of my home studio. That's cool. I can write music for TV. That's good. But what if I could get a gig at this college? So I get in touch with the people at Berkeley. Looks kind of good, looks promising. So I told her, I said, look, I think I can, I think we could move back East, raise our kids back East where your family is. She has an extended family. I don't, you know, we the cost of living is easier. It's funny because Boston's expensive, but compared to LA, well, I think anything is like to LA, right? easier. Yeah. And so I said, maybe this, and then what if I can get this gig then, you know? So I said, why don't we take a shot? Why don't we sit? Because we were going to move anyway. I said, why don't we sell our house in LA? Let's, let's pack it up. Let's move to Massachusetts. I'm going to open up a studio at my place. Let me see if I can produce some local stuff. I'm going to still come to LA and do sessions when I can. So, right. And I still was, you know, but I didn't have to live in LA. I was, so anyway, so we moved and then I, I wound up, it took a while, but I wound up getting a gig and, um, at Berkeley in 2003. Um, I mean, it wasn't, you know, if I had gotten the gig right away, it probably wouldn't have been a good thing because, well, I probably couldn't have done it because shortly after I moved here in 98, I'm in te Texas doing the Re Leon Rhyme Rec Rhyme Rhymes records. Yeah. So that was a whole nother, you know. It was almost like I could have stayed in LA and just gone to Texas and worked there, but you know, it didn't work out that way. But the good news is I'm still gigging at Berkeley, man. And it's, it's better than ever, you know? So you right. moved to Boston in 98 and you got the gig in 03. Yeah. I moved to Boston in 96. 96. And I, and I, and I, and I contacted them initially when I got here and they had a position open in the guitar department. And honestly, I actually interviewed for it. But there were a lot of people that wanted it and I didn't get the gig, but I had, I told them, I said, you know, I'm here now, but all my, you know, I'm still going to be going to LA and doing sessions. And so, you know, there may be some, you know, I, in the interview, I was leveled with them. I said, yeah, you know, I can do it, but you know, I'm, I may be spending some time out of town and like that, you know, and it was true. Cause I was still going back. I mean, I moved to Massachusetts and knew where I was two weeks after I was doing a record in Redondo Beach with Michael Joachim and Freebo. I mean, you know, and, and Albert Lee and, you know. And, <laughs> Let me ask and, you, you this. Know, with the 18 people. I mean, you know. So I had moved the physical family and everything, but I was still back and forth because I was still getting calls, you know. So I think, first of all, that's, I, I'm really, that's awesome, man, because a lot of, 
you know, I talk to people, we all talk to people all the time. You know, where are you living? Oh, Detroit. Oh, I fucking hate it. Well, man, they got airplanes getting out of there, right? You know, everybody, you, you can leave, right? Or wherever right. you are, or in Memphis or Nashville, you know. Um, what, and what prompted, you, you were really ready for this. It, it, like, it, it didn't seem like you stressed and agonized over it, and it went, and it wasn't necessarily easy. Nothing's easy, or well, most things are not easy, but you made it work. Uh, like, for people that are stuck, that can't, you know, they're afraid to do something, what advice would you offer in a situation like that? Because I think a lot of people have dreams that which is what that was it was a dream and that they i think the perception is unless i can go and execute my dream on the first day then i'm a failure which is you know i don't know i've had a couple of dreams none of them have taken a day most of them haven't worked but the ones that do don't take a day uh, and i just thought that was a really good story so if you can comment on that for people that might want I, I to think do. fun i think fun a couple of things fundamentally fundamentally you have to understand in the entertainment business, right? What you want and what you get are going to be two different things. Look, mm. when I was a kid and I was practicing guitar every day, my sister said to me one day, she says, what do you want to do? You know, I'm probably 19, maybe early, younger. What do you want to do? I said, I'm going to be the best guitarist ever in the world because I'm work. I'm practicing, you know, six hours a day. I'm work. I'm man. I'm working at it. Right. Right. And she said, you're never going to be the best guitarist <laughs> in the world. <coughs> and I said, Oh, wow. I mean, it was heartbreaking. Yeah. And then I well, I said, but okay, how do you make it work? And that's when I, you know, great Jay Graydon and, you know, people influenced me and said, look, this is what you got to do, you know? And so I had, look, you know what I wanted to do? Here's what I wanted to do. I wanted to write a hit song like my brother did. And I wanted to, or multiple hit songs. And I wanted to have a band that was a hit band. And I wanted to tour the world and be in a hit band. That's what I wanted to do. That was my goal. I spent more time writing songs when I was in my early twenties. After my guitar skills got pretty good, I spent, I quit practicing scales and stuff. I started writing songs. That's, that's all I wanted to do is write a hit. That's all I wanted to do. And I spent just eons of time trying to write a hit. Never wrote a hit. Wrote a couple of things that got cut and were cool. But, but, you know, see, so my mindset was not, I have to write a hit or I'm a failure. My mindset was, I have to make a living in the music industry somehow. So I'm going to be a session musician. And while I'm doing that, I'm going to try and write the hit. The hit never happened. And at a certain point, I went, okay, wait a second. If I'm not going to write the hit, then what I'll do is I'll write music for television. Cool, let's do that. And then, then, then the session world changes. And then you say, okay, well, now what is it? Okay, well, I can maybe produce independent people. I went to my friend Danny Deonte at Capitol Records when I, was, when I was a hot studio musician. And I said, Danny, I want to produce... I want to produce, man. I want to move up into the production seat. And he said, look, if you want to do that, you need to find an artist you like. You need to develop them. You need to do what it takes to get that happening. And then you need to come to me and I can see if I can get it signed at Columbia. And I'm like, okay. But I thought about it and I thought, man, that's a lot of work. I'm, yeah. I'm not going to go there. You know, it's too much time and energy into something that's not, who knows, you know? Very so, sketchy, so likely. I tell my kids at Berkeley, I says, look, you're gonna you want to entertain you want to enter the entertainment industry you have an idea of what you want in your life this is what you want to do you want to be this in the entertainment business you want to be a player you want to be an engineer you want to be a producer you want to do whatever it is and you have absolutely no idea what door is going to open and whenever that door opens you got to walk through it and say i'm going to do this now because you're in the business and right. that's the point is the point is to stay in my brother, John, <coughs> my oldest brother, John <coughs> tried to have a career as an actor after he was a songwriter. He pulled me aside one day when he had, when he got a gig as a stock analyst or something like that, and he's going to work every day in a place. 
And he said, Marty, whatever you can do, man, stay in the arts. And I must have been, I don't know, probably 30 or something like that at the time. And I'm like, yeah, stay in the arts. How do you stay in the arts? And so what wound up happening was, you know, I might have, and look, there, everything has a shelf life. You're a, you are a, you have a hit record. You're a star for a minute and then you're not. Right. You know, many acts, many artists, they have a big hit, you know, they have a big hit record. They're a big deal for, for that period of time. 10 years later, there's a whole new crop of people that are big and this, the, that people, that those people are done. So I've always known this. I've always known the, the studio musicians, Hal Blaine, all those guys that were in the wrecking crew. I saw them, I saw their careers end. And now it was Jeff Beccaro and Paige and Louis Shelton and Graydon and, and, and Larry Carlton. And all of those guys that were doing sessions in the 60s, you know where they are? They're all on the road. They're on the road, you know? And now it's a new crop of guys doing sessions. And when I came in, though that crop of guys started to move out. And it was like, okay, I came in with this crew, you know, Carlos yeah. Vega and, and, and Landau and, and, you know, that, Though that, and, but I knew, I said, look, there's a, there's a shelf life to this. So how long am I going to keep that going? And it's like, okay, session, I could see it. It was early 90s, and I go, rap, Nirvana, session world's going to die. Okay, now what? And I'm, you know, people are still working. I'm still gigging, but I'm going, this is a, this is a dead end. And then I got hit the digital, and I went, okay, wait a second. This is going to change everything. I got an HTML book. I put up my website, martywalsh.com before anybody had a website i literally had one before bank of America. you did you coded your own website mm -hmm. that's so funny man yeah yeah that's scott awesome. page, my buddy scott page was going dude digital digital it's going to change everything and so you know i kind of you know just kind of i've never been one to say this is what i have to do i've always been one to say i'm going to do this because this is the opportunity that's presented itself and then that opportunity typically leads to other opportunities. Right, right. right. Well, I think what Way you said, go. the overriding question, which was how can I make this work? Yeah. And for you, the, this part was I want to be in the arts. I want to play my guitar. I want to be involved in music. And then so you just and, and as an entrepreneur, which every single musician is an entrepreneur, they may not exactly. feel like that, but you own your own business and your own destiny, therefore. Uh, as a guy who's been self-employed for 22 years, adaptability, which is exactly what you're talking about, is a, your friend. If you are not flexible or adaptable, do not work for yourself. Go get a job. You've yeah. got to be ready to change, man. Right. No, that's so, that's so true. That's, that's very well put. That's exactly yeah. right. We did, this is great, man. I'm really, I'm, I'm glad you talked about that because I, again, I hear I this. I talk about it with my students all the time. And then, you know, honestly, Craig, long, you know, when I got the gig at Berkeley, I called people I knew in LA and I would say, I called Jay and I go, dude, I'm freaking teaching at Berkeley College of Music. And everybody would say, oh man, what a great way to wrap it up. You yeah. Know? Like, right. yeah, you had this career of all this stuff. I toured the world with Supertramp, you know, freaking met Princess Di. I mean, played the Albert. I mean, you know, look, did, did, you know, did, did I have disappointments? Did I have the band that had the big hit? It was my music that I played the Albert Hall with? No. Played the Albert Hall. You got the experience of it. That was cool. Right. But, um, but I don't know that that's the definite. The problem with that is, I, and I've talked to hundreds of musicians, you go into this business thinking th that's your definition of success, not knowing that's not an accurate definition of success. It's just what you see, yeah. you know. But by any stretch of the imagination, you've had a very successful career doesn't have to be that, you know? Absolutely. And, and, yeah, yeah. You know, and then you, I, I talk to people that are my age that, you know, that are still going, oh man, the New record business sucks and I got no gigs and I got, and I'm going, well, dude, like, you know, it's because I, I know people that are, that are in their fifties and sixties complaining that they're not doing sessions anymore. And I'm like, do you know who's doing sessions? Not that there's a lot of them around necessarily. It's a, it's a different world. People are working from home. But you know who's working? Young people. Yeah. What is the, what's the, what, there's a great 
uh, little riff that I'll use my name for it. Yeah, I know what you're going to say. Go ahead. Yeah. Who's Marty Walsh? <laughs> Get me Marty <laughs> Walsh. Yeah. Get me a young Marty Walsh. Who's Marty Walsh? Right. And I mean, look, you know, it, it, insert name. I mean, that's, just, yeah. you know. Yeah. So, but I think the, you know, what you said was very true. It's like, if you can't be flexible, you know, the, the industry and life in gen, I've always thought. And life so, in general. Yes, man. It's gonna, there are dictated terms that you are going to, your life is, well, I don't, I, you know, can't get too deep into it, but, you know, cause that'll take too much time, but, but. You have to go, you have to open, you have to be open to what it is. You can't dictate it. If you say, this is absolutely what I have to have in life, you're probably not going to get it. Or you're you know? going to be real frustrated. Yeah, you're going to just be super frustrated. And, and you're going to miss other things that might mean? be a lot better for you. Oh, yeah. yeah. You know? Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, what is the, uh, and I'm not a religious guy, but someone at all, but I am sort of spiritual. And someone said, what's that joke? Uh, you you want to make, uh, want to make God laugh, tell him your plans, you know, like, <laughs> Oh, that's I mean, a good one. Yeah. Like, yeah, who's yeah. That, you know, you, you just gotta be open, man. You gotta have those. And especially as a creative, you obviously have the ability to be open, creative people, the most open people that I've ever met. Right. Very yeah. open. And you gotta be open to that for yourself for your own life. man. Yeah. True. My experience. True. Um, tell me, I know you have some side hustles or another side hustle going. What, do you, what is that? If you're Oh, no, not, <laughs> that's kind of a joke. Uh, I read that. I, 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 um, you want to skip I, that? I've always been big on like, <laughs> I've got this great idea, like, man. I got the million dollar idea now. I got it. You know? Yeah. Right? So years ago, here's my side, here's my side hustle joke. Years ago, I'm doing weddings. Right. Mm. They had a campaign in California called use a gun, go to prison. Mm. If you had used a gun in the, in the commission of a crime, you're going to go to jail no matter what. It's like, right. if you use a gun, you're going to jail. So I'm sitting there at some bar mitzvah talking to um, the accordion player on the gig, Frank Morocco, who was actually a really freaking great jazz accordion player and did all kinds of session work. But he says, Hey, I think they should make a, you know, that thing, use a gun, go to prison. They should make a, they should make, it should say, use an accordion, go to jail, right? <laughs> and I said, this is beautiful. This is a million dollar deal, man. That's so what I did is I enlisted an artist and we created bumper stickers that had an accordion with a circle and the line through it. Right, right. And it said, use an accordion, go to jail. <laughs> and I took them to Valley Arts Guitar Center in, in, in Studio City yep. and they sold them, right? Oh my they God. sold them for like two bucks a freaking bumper sticker and I paid off the cost to make them and uh, I still have a bunch of them in the room. And you got there. the licensing. And, you know, Do so you anyway, so it was just hysterical. Oh, it was okay. Like, it was like funny. too funny. And That's then, funny. so that was my, that was, this is my side hustle. And then, but you know, what's funny, man, is that, is that when Weird Al Yankovic came out, Yeah. if you look at his very first record, there's a, it's a, it's a cartoon drawing thing of him laying on a bed and there's, there's crap everywhere there's just a, it's just a mess right and on the he bed frame header the footer thing there's a freaking your sticker says, yeah it's not my sticker but it says use an accordion go to jail because he played accordion right yeah yeah and i'm like i'm like dude you stole my deal man you know that's so bullshit. I tried, he played here he played in massachusetts once years ago and my son was a big weird Al fan and i tried to get a hold of his management and i was going to say hey i'm the guy with the buffer sticker man you need uh, i'll bring you a couple you know yeah. you need to give me some free tickets but that's so I'm, funny anyway do, do you know his guitar my player? side hustle huh you know his guitar player Kim, jim Kimo west lovely guy really nice guy. he's been with him for like 25 years oh, wow. very nice guy yeah very serious player yeah. uh low points what were some low points or maybe dark periods you've had to deal with and how'd you get through them? You know, it's, um, it, it's, it's, uh, it, it's the life of a, the life of a musician, of a freelance musician. Yeah. Ups up and, and down. down. 
Yep. So literally, like, um, here's one for you. Um, it's 1991. I think it was 1991, and my <laughs> probably me. my young my my youngest son had just been born, or it he could have or. It was either 90 or probably not. If it was 91, my son, my second son was just born. You know, I'm working, man, but it's, it's, you know, the way you, the way you have to work when you're, when you're a freelance man is you, is you, you work, you stockpile all the bread because come November, you know, there's not, nothing's happening in session land, you know, November, January, November, December, or end of November, December, January, you know, those are pretty dead months, you know, and you still got to pay the bills. So you're always stockpiling the bread. You go to the bank account, you pay the bills when you're not working. And then, and then you get all the calls, you know, phone starts ringing late January. Now you're in the session land in February, March, April, May, June, you know, then touring happens and sessions start to wane a little bit, you know, and you come back and you do a few more. It's this crazy thing, right? So yeah. that's the way you got to live your life. So in 91, man it was dark it was low like like the, the dough was down and it was like dude what am i gonna do like like literally i got two kids i got the mortgage i got the thing and work is starting to get scarce and it's scary you know and i was yeah new, i was i was like man i was really worried you know and um and i but but you know this is the way the industry is man it's funny because it's like it you hit the, and, and I had a number of times like that where you're like, you know, okay, I'm, am I working? I don't know. I'm not working right now. You know, oh, next week I'm working. Oh, I'm kicking ass. You know, yeah. and you're like, okay, well, I didn't do anything the last three weeks. What's going on? Am I done? And, uh, you know, so you're, but anyway, in this particular time, uh, <coughs> things were, it, it was particularly bad. You know, the dough, the, the dough was low. I was wondering how I was going to make it work. And, um, and I was at a friend of mine's house, John Jolliffe, who I was writing songs with. And, uh, he, and my wife called over there and said, Hey, you got to call a fellow by the name of Frank Musker that I was writing with, who was living in London at the time. Um, but I, he lived in LA and I did a bunch of work with him. And so she said, you got it. Frank just called. He's got a gig in Milan in uh, for like five weeks arranging oh, an album, arranging an album, and you're like the guy. <laughs> so I'm like, you know, on the phone, and this is, I don't even know, this is, I don't have a cell phone, this, I don't know what we were, how we were communicating, but I'm like jamming, like yeah. getting on the phone with Frank, and he's like, yeah, you got to call this girl Anna. And she's going to hook you up with this producer and blah, blah, blah. And bang, blah. and I call this Claudio dentist guy. And it's like, yeah, man, we're going to send you the FedEx, you the ticket. You got to get here right away. And boom, boom. And there I was, bang. I'm like, and I did this record with this guy, Massimo Riva. And it was killer. It was a great record. So there you go. It's like, yeah. you're, really, you're really on the brink of like, okay, now am I going to refinance the house again? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Pay the bills. And then boom. And you've been, oh, you've been with your the same wife weeks. the whole time? Yeah. How long have you been together with your wife? We just had our 40th Christmas together, and we've been Dude, congr for 38 that is, years. Congratulations, man. That is wonderful. That's well, awesome, she's, man. She's the coolest, man. That's awesome. Very she's cool. She's just, you know, when I met her and, and, you know, just subsequent life, she's just, she's just really cool. She's just, you know, she's just. You, let me tell you, you need somebody like that when you're self employed, because I've had highs and lows in my own businesses man right. that puts a lot of stress on a relationship not i, I mean it, it's just a stressful to live in that scenario yeah and if if you don't have somebody that's totally committed and behind you if you do you're i have had for 27 years and you've had for 40 i couldn't imagine what the people who like have that stress and then don't have the comfort of the underlying relationship, at least, you know, the stress is related to this, not the actual, that's gotta be a fucking nightmare, man. You know? Yeah, so. And you know, it's funny too, cause she's so, she never said, oh, okay, things are getting tough. You got to get a gig. She was always like, yeah, well, something will happen. Yeah, you know? that's great. And then, and then, um, it's funny because when I started, when I, when I was teaching at Berkeley, I'm doing it 
but I was still producing a lot of stuff out of my home studio here, which I don't really do much anymore, but, but I, I was still, you know, and I was getting a lot of gigs, man. I mean, that was the thing. I moved here and I was working my ass off. Christ. I was all of a sudden, bang, I'm producing all this people, man, and, uh, you know, that are local. And uh, anyway, so the bread was getting pretty good at like producing stuff, but I'm teaching at Berkeley. And, and I said to her jokingly, I go, hey, you know, I don't know about this Berkeley thing, man. I think I might like lose that and like just do this other thing. And she goes, no way. She says, <laughs> she says you've never had the freaking check come in every two weeks and you're not stopping it now. And I was yeah, like, good ah. for her, man. Yeah. <laughs> good, good you listened. Good you yeah. listened. Yeah, but. Hey, let's talk about gear. Uh, yeah. What was your primary go-to guitar over time? And maybe what would be your top? three that you played um uh i the go-to guitar was absolutely a it was a valley arts strat but it was a valley arts james tyler hybrid what what it was was i had a i bought a um uh a, a schecter guitar from kenny lee lewis who plays with uh with uh, steve miller he had this he oh had wait this, a minute yeah he plays bass now yeah yeah, because yeah, I had uh do you know Jacob Peterson? That's Steve's no. guitar. Well, Kenny, well, yeah, Kenny the, the, the guy from Norway or uh, uh, Denmark. Denmark, yeah, yeah. We just yeah. had dinner. We just had dinner a few months ago. Really nice guy, yeah. Yeah. But anyway, um Kenny sold me this guitar. And I thought, you know, I'm gonna change the pickups. So I changed the pickups with Mike McGuire at Valley Arts. And then I said, man, I'm going to change the neck. So I changed the neck with Mike. <laughs> and then I'm like, okay. That's like surgery, I, man. I think, I think, and I, then I met James Tyler. And, uh, and I said, you know, he, he was making guitars. And they were really nice. And I was like, yeah, Tyler's cool. And I, and I went to his shop and he had a body there. It was a basswood body that he had, that he had done. But the guy that he did it for wasn't paying up. So he goes, you know, I, I did it. I didn't have a home for it. I went, yeah, well, put that on my guitar and put your mid boost in it. Give me your mid boost, you know? So James did that and that became the guitar. I had, um, and, and then Bradshaw, Bob Bradshaw, who had built my rack, right. um, told me about this guy who was making picks up, pickups out of his garage in Detroit, Tim, Tim Jagman. So I, I ordered one of those and I slotted that, had a guy slot that in and that was it, boom. I was like, oh man, this is great. So that That's was the a guitar with, that was the Super Tramp guitar. That was the Fogarty guitar. That was all the touring. That was all the sessions, you know. That yeah. was the main strat. So there's been that one. There's this one here, which is a. Um, so many people love those Valley Arts guitars. What, yeah. what happened with them? They just couldn't make it or? Well, they, they wound up going, they wound up getting actually really big where they, because Mike was custom making all the guitars for everybody, for Luke, for Larry yeah. Carlton, you know, Jay, me. He was doing all these guitars. And um, and then it got so big that what he had, he, he actually start, you know, went, got a factory that he put together. Okay. And they started to manufacture and sell them, right? But then he and his partner decided to get out of Valley Arts and Mike moved to Nashville and he became the, um, they sold... They sold the store to someone and they sold the Valley Arts brand to Samick. Oh, okay. So Samick started making cheap guitars that had the Valley Arts logo on it. <laughs> All right. Um, but yeah, and they're very West Coast, man. People down here don't even know what they are, you know? Yeah, mostly West Coast, yeah. But everybody yeah. who's played them loves them. So at, at Valley <laughs> Arts, when I'm, when I'm starting to get my, my stuff together to do sessions, I go on there one day with cash. I go, look, I need a nylon string guitar. I need a steel string acoustic. I need, and I see this on the wall. It's a Fender Esquire. Mm. Oh, right? wow. It's a 1959 Fender Esquire. Very cool. Now, it had this pickup, but it didn't have these, right? Just a stock Esquire. I paid 400 bucks for it. Because it's all, you know, the finish is all off it and stuff, you know. I, so anyway, it plays the bomb, and I had these two pickups, and I said, look, um, I, these came off of a 1970 Les Paul. They're the small. The mini humbuckers? humbuckers? Yeah. I had McGuire take these off of my 70 Les Paul way, way, way back, years, 10 years before. 
and put big humbuckers on it. I had the less gold top, less power with the small humbuckers. Sure. But I thought, hey, I'm gonna put, I wanna get fatter. I'm gonna put the bigger humbuckers on. So I had these sitting around and I sat there with Mike and I said, look, let's put these on this guitar, but let's do this. I never liked the way a humbucker sounded on a, on a telly, but this one's gonna be, it's gonna be not as fat as a humbucker. It doesn't have the same fat sound. But I said, look, let's back it off. We actually worked on where to place them. I said, let's not put it straight up there. Let's back this off and, you know, and get a little bit more mid rangey And then we figured out where to place this one. So we did it. And this is the guitar that I did. I did nine to five on it. I did all the early records, man, all the rhythm tracks were on this thing. That's really you know? cool. And, and what I a mean, smart idea to experiment like on a $400 guitar. Yeah, well, you know, freaking, I, I, but the problem is I carved into it, which was stupid. This is a 1959 Esquire. If I know, but it was, stock, but it was 400 was, bucks. I know it was 400 bucks. You did but the you right thing. You know, what's funny too, is Mike made a Valley Arts Tele combination for Brent Mason. Brent Mason, yeah. Right? Yeah. He comes out with this guitar. You know what's on it? That. The humbuckers, <laughs> the, the mini hums. Wow, that's pretty and funny. I thought, yeah, because hey, I had. Man, I was what? the first guy, man, that had it. You know. I had but anyway, Brent so, on the so show. it was like you know you got to have a Fender, you got to have a Strat, and you got to have a Tele. And my my Strat's more of a more of a hypey, you know, that '80s hypey sound, you know. Yeah. And so there's so this was the baby that I did all. These rhythm pickups, I did all kinds of, you know, tracks with these. Nine to five was probably the back pickup, but I don't know. But anyway, this has always been like the go-to guitar, along with that, that Valley Arts. And then, um, and then at one point, somebody said, hey, you don't have a Strat that sounds like a Strat. Like, I had a few different Strats, but they are all the warmth, you know. So yes. my friend Dennis O'Donnell... Uh, knew the guy that was at the Fender fact Fender place, and I got this baby. This is this is one of the very first editions of the Lace Sensor. Pickups. Okay. Yep, I you know? see him. Yep. And so, so yeah, I picked this up from the Fender factory. Um, you know, it's just got a great neck. It's got a great sound. And so this is a, this is on a lot of the records I did. If I needed a Strat, I would go here. If I needed a Tele, I would go to the to the Esquire and then if I needed the overdrive sound I would go to the um, to the to the Valley Arts pretty much you know do you have the Valley Arts there is it is that handy it's in the other room oh okay you want to get it no it's not a big deal if it was right there I was just okay. curious to, to look at it well you know I lost it how's that happen <laughs> it got stolen how did you get it back <laughs> I know man I told you I got stories here's the deal I'm going to do <coughs> sessions for Leon Rhymes in Texas I have it in an anvil case. I check it in with American Airlines. I fly to Texas. There's no guitar. I go, what the hell? They go, well, no, it must. Have, it's coming in a later plane. It doesn't show up. <laughs> on and on and on we go. No guitar. I call about, I talk to about the American Airlines. They go, well, you got to fill out the form. We can give you 2,500 bucks for a piece of lost luggage. And I go, okay. So I fill out the form. And on the form, I go, look, I was, the, you know, comments. I was working for Leon Rhines. She loves this guitar. I did not have the guitar because the guitar was now lost or was not at my session. This is the Super Tramp guitar. This is the John Fogarty guitar. This is the blue. I put all, this is all so the names, funny. Threw all the names at them. Right? <coughs> they said it was going to take eight weeks. In four weeks, I had a check for 2,500 bucks. Good. I call Mike McGuire, who's at the Gibson fact, the head of the Gibson Custom Shop. I go, Mike, my Valley Art Strat is gone. How did, how did we build it? He goes, that was Warmoth stuff, Warmoth neck, and the radius, the, the fret wire was this particular thing. So that's that. And he show, told me of everything to get. So I go to Warmoth. I order all the parts. I go to James Tyler. I go, dude, I don't have the guitar with the mid boost anymore. I need your mid boost. And he goes, man, buy my guitar. I go, oh, I can't. It's 3500 bucks or something. I said, just can you sell me a mid? It took me like three phone calls. He finally reneged and he freaking sold me a mid boost. I go, James, I got to have the mid boost, man. Come on. So, um, so, and then I called the guy from Detroit and I said, dude, I've lost my guitar. 
I need you to build the pickup. So he builds me the pickup. I take all the parts and I take it to my tech, right? That 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 I that I work with here in Massachusetts. We build the guitar, it's great. I go, okay, but it's still I've lost my guitar. This is terrible, it's a drag. My tech, Pat DeBurro, who's phenomenal. He, have, he has a couple of days where he works at a local guitar center doing whatever, fixes. He calls me up, leaves a message on my voicemail. Hey, man, I'm here at Guitar Center, and this Valley Art Strat just came through. I know you like these things. It's not the one you used to own, but, you know, they're selling it for like 200 bucks. <laughs> and, I, and I go, oh, geez. I call Valley Arts. I get the manager on the line who I knew, Tom Moore. I go, Tom, my Strat's gone you got a valley art strat that just came in he goes let me look it up he it's a seven o'clock at night he goes yeah here it is uh what was the serial number i go there was no serial number man it was like put together with these parts from this sh long story but there's no serial number he's like there's no serial number on this guitar i go i'm coming down i get in my car i fly down there right i go i see it as i'm walking and i see it and i go and my heart sinks i go no uh oh no man i walk in and i go wait a minute wait a second i'm looking at it and i'm going that's my guitar but those aren't the pickups of the pick guard so somebody ripped it off from logan airport and re replaced the pickups waited a couple of months Took it to Valley, took it to Guitar Center, and sold it to him for 150 bucks. Really? And, weird. and there were some unique things. There was some drawing and stuff and belt buckle stuff on the back of the guitar that I described. And he goes, This is your guitar. I go, I know it is. So I go, Well, let's get the guy, man. Let's file. I go, I filed the police report. Let's, you know, let's go get this dude. And he goes, Look, Marty, if we do this, they're going to take your guitar as evidence. So you're not going to have it. You have to go to court. You have to prove that this guy stole your yeah, guitar. Yeah, that's just say you thank you and move on. Oh god. And no. then he says, he says, look, I paid 150 bucks for it. Give me 150 bucks. I'll put it on the seven day hold. You can come pick it up. I went, there's my credit card. Absolutely, man. Yeah, just move on on that thing. To have the serendipity to get it back. Yeah. <laughs> so and then I then I got my guy from Detroit to give me the new pickup. I got another Tyler mid boost again. And and it's exactly as I had it had it and you got a new guitar out of it and i got a new guitar out of it and <laughs> an amp the guitar gotta, cost me about 1500 bucks i had another grand left over i bought some go. amp with it <laughs> there you go so it turns out oh yeah, yeah man, you should you if you want to go after this. you want to go after the guy thank him yeah <laughs> you can't write this stuff no that's awesome man i was crazy wow. it was painful uh, for a lot of months it was painful man yeah oh and the guitar never leaves the house yeah Never take understand. it out. I've taken it out like twice, and it scares the hell out of me. Yeah, I get you. Man. <laughs> uh, tell me your top three Desert Island discs. Uh, yeah, that, that's pretty easy. Oh, okay. Uh, Mad, Mad Dogs and Englishmen by Joe Cocker. Yeah. Tour, the, the tour, double album. Gotta have it. I can listen to that one album the rest of my life. Um, <clears throat> Plays Live by Peter Gabriel. Right, first time someone uh, said a Gabriel live record. Oh yeah, it's the best. And um, and the Kenny Burrell. Boy, this is tough because it could be the, the it could be the Bino Clapton record, but but probably if I'm on a desert island, I need some very some stuff that's varied. So Kenny Burrell guitar forms. You familiar with this record? Uh, you know what, man? I'm late to the party with Kenny Burrell, and I just started listening to him. And in fact, between him and Grant Green, this is, I just got this Ibanez jazz box because of those guys, yeah, because I Grant, love, love the, Grant the Green. tone. Yeah. It's just tone. like really yeah. cool, man. I and know. I'm not a jazz guy, but just to play blues with that tone and, you know, it, I'm, I'm kind of becoming a better player because I'm sliding and I just seem more incentivized to, to, to pick more notes. Right. And then when I pick up a, my, any of my other guitars that have nines on them with this is 11 flat wound. It's like, you know, it's like when you're a kid and you put the donut on the bat before you go swing it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. 
you know oh, so right 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 you know it's just like it seems like it's easier it's it, and it's just yeah. the tone of i love kenny burrell man i really do and, and that particular record the reason that i that i would say that is because kenny does all different styles so he does an he does a he does a nylon string acoustic thing then he turns around and does like a flat pick travis pick tune and then he does like a bebop song. He's got all different styles. That's why it's called guitar forms. Yeah, I'm gonna it's, check it's it out. Stylistically, I, I've told all kinds of guitar players about it. I got to get that record because it's got every stylistic thing that you would want to approach. He's got it there. It's it's twelve different or ten different styles of guitar playing. Oh, uh, his it's tone cool. is it's just, really it's a really good record. What great tone, you know him yeah. and Grant Green. I just to, it's very not what I've always listened to. It's very nice. Yeah, man. yeah we love Grant Green. All right, tell me, uh, <laughs> this is gonna be interesting. What's the, what do you like most about yourself, Marty? You're a pretty confident guy. You seem pretty confident. Or you're faking it. Well, with... no, no. I mean, look, if I mean, I, you know, <laughs> that's so funny. What a freaking question. I know. You know it's funny, man. I'm, you know, I'm working with Vinny Kaliuta last week, right? Yeah. Which was unbelievable because Vinny's Vinny, and and you know you say the word Vinny to a musician, and they all go know who it is. I mean, my students are like their jaws on the floor that I'm actually playing with them. Sure. There's some actual, well, there's some stuff on Facebook of us at the session. These people actually posted some some work that we were doing from the they took from the control room, and you can hear the audio. But anyway, so Vinny, we're at the, <laughs> we we cut the first track right, and Vinny's a freaking comedian. I mean, the dude is like always like being funny. He's just that's the way he is, and and he goes. We're st you know, there's probably 12 people in this control room at Un United, the United, the studio was like, you know, the biggest, I mean, Frank, everybody, you know, it's huge history, you know, and there we are in studio A, man, you know, huge deal. And he's sitting on the couch and he looks over at me and, and we worked together a lot back years ago and right. we haven't seen each other and I can't tell you how long. And he's like, oh, 15 years, I guess it was. And he goes, hey, man. You look like you're just about ready to dig yourself. <laughs> <laughs> you know, he, broke, he broke the whole room up, man. It was like, ah, yeah. You know. But anyway, look, if I had to, if I had to, if I had to pick a quality, you know, I suppose, like, I don't know. I mean, I, you know, I mean, how, you know, what do you like about yourself? Well, I don't know. Uh, I used to like my hair, <laughs> you know, but. Um, you get no sympathy if, from me if, out of that. If I had to pick a if I had to pick a quality, I think I would have to say um, that I accept life as it comes. I, I, I don't have I don't have expectations from people. I don't expect things from people. Therefore, I get along with people really well because what they give me is what's cool with me. You yeah, know? you're. Yeah. I, I, you know, I mean, I'm very, I'm very easy going that way. You know, I don't argue with people. I don't fight. I don't. And I drive my wife a little crazy because I never <laughs> argue with her. But it's like I, I learned early on. I said, look, people are the way they are, and they're doing what they want to do because they think it's in their best interest. Yeah. So. Or the best they can. Yeah. And yeah. so, you know, I'm just, you know, and then at the same time, you know, I look at life and I go, well, okay, well, this is cool. I like this part of this situation. So I'm going to go that, do that. Yeah. And then over here, I'm not digging what's happening here. So I don't need you people. I'll leave you, man. You can find other people. Hang, you know? Yeah. So I've been very kind of, I've been very kind of just go with life. It's t it goes back into entrepreneurial stuff. Like, yeah, I don't have to have written the hit record. I don't have to have been in the band. I was able to do what I want, do what I do, what was fun and cool without having a preconceived notion as to what it had to be. So I guess that would, if I had to pick a, if I had to pick a quality, I guess that would probably be it. You know? That's good. It's a lot less stress when you don't have expectations of others. Yeah. yeah. I mean, people are all stressed and crazy and I'm like, man, why, you know, fine. Look, there are a lot of people in this world. If there are people that, you know, you're like all bummed out because your friends are a drag, find new friends. I mean, it's pretty simple. <laughs> right know? on. Yeah. You don't like where you're living? Leave. Yeah, leave. Right. <laughs> go, you know, go live somewhere else, you know. I, I, I mean, agree I, with you, man. 
I'm, that's probably another reason why you're successful because in my opinion anyway the people that are able to take responsibility for themselves easiest and don't expect anybody else to do it they tend to be the more successful people you know if you're waiting for somebody to do you know uh if you build it they will come that's in the fucking movies man you know you got to make shit happen Although I did love that movie, and when I moved back, <laughs> when I moved back east, we did go to the field, <laughs> and we did play baseball on the field with my kids. It, did you? Did, so you Absolutely. like you like living there now? Everything worked out. Massachusetts. Yeah, it worked out. It was ex exactly what you planned. Yeah, pretty much. It it worked out. I mean, my wife still goes. God, I wish we could have stayed in L.A. Our house we sold is tripled. The yeah. house we have here is doubled. The house we sold in L.A. is tripled. And I do go to LA and I go, you know, I wouldn't mind coming back. Well, the weather is a huge the thing, weather, man. Yeah, yeah I, I but know. At, but then at the same time, man, I don't know what's going on with this global warming thing. But dude, I'm looking at my yard. There ain't no snow out there. Yeah. And, and, and honestly, most of the days, most of the days in the winter now are between 30 and 40, which yeah. is man, which is super manageable. Yeah, it's totally. It's not different. LA, 50, LA's 50 to 60, but you know, in the winter. So yeah. you're 30 to 40. But, you know, you get about maybe five, seven on the outside. You might get 10 days a year that are like cold. They're like, yeah. you, know, you know, oh, man, this is like freaking Wind cold. chill shit. Yeah. But you just, you know, so it's 10 days out of 365. Well, it's easy enough to handle. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's funny. When I went to Nam, that was really my first time in L.A. Oh, outside really? of passing through an airport. Yeah. And uh, it was for there, it was cold. Everybody was walking around right. with jackets. But for me, this is what was really weird. Now, I'm in Florida, so you'd think I'd be cold. It was the, what happened was something, because there's no humidity and it's so dry. Yeah. I just loved it. I, I didn't, I just had a t shirt on. Yeah. And I, I, I said, man, I, now I understand. Yeah why people move here this weather is oh, like yeah. it's january and i'm walking around in a t-shirt yeah you get off the plane and you go oh yeah you know. I, I, it was easy to see why you know especially as a guy yeah, who's a, i'm actually i'm actually planning on you know my wife and i have been talking about you know where do we go once because we're getting close to like calling it you know retirement time and um and uh you know we live here my kids are here they're pretty yeah. much you know but we were looking at moving. We were looking at trying to um, find a little place down in Myrtle Beach or something like that. But we went to L.A. last year, and I said, "Screw that! Four months a year, we're going to go live in L.A." Good for you. We're just going to get on a plane, go there, rent an apartment in yep. Studio City, hang out, see all of our. We went there last year. We spent a couple of weeks in L.A. and saw all of our old friends and all the right. people we used to hang with. I got all these. I grew up with all these people there, man. Yeah. Those are, those are, that's my world I grew up in. So, yeah. so that's, you know, what I want to do. I'm going to go back home for four months a year. So that's kind of the plan. You know? Right on, man. Good for yeah. you. Yeah. Tell me who's had the biggest influence on you musically and also personally. Well, this is an, this is a good question and I'm glad you asked it because musically, I mean, I guess I could, I guess I could, I would, you know, I've mentioned his name a bunch in the interview, but, you know, Jay Graydon, I think yeah. would be the musical, the guy that influenced me musically probably the most. But at the same time, there were two things that happened to me that really molded, really molded who I am as a person. The first one was I'm studying with Barney Kessel. Oh, jazz wow. Guitar player. He, Barney, when at Session World started to end for Barney, he was teaching. And I was, I, I found an ad in the musician's newspaper that he was giving lessons and I booked him and I started taking lessons from him and he was really cool. And he was my guitar hero. I mean, the first jazz guitarist I heard was a record my brother John had and it was a Barney Kessel record and I absolutely loved it. It was called Contemporary Latin Rhythms. And I just ate that record up when I was a kid, loved every minute of it. So I get to study with the guy and <clears throat> So I'm going to these lessons, and one day he says to me, he says, hey, Marty, listen. He says, I'm gonna, I'm, I want to make a recommendation to you, a book recommendation. And this isn't a music thing, and this isn't, 
you know, this is me as a friend to tell you about a book that I think would be really important for you and men people to read. It's by a guy named Harry Brown, and it's called How I Found Freedom in an Unfree World. And I bought this book, and some of the stuff that I was talking about earlier, about, you know, allowing people to just be, you know, um, came from that book. I read that book, and it changed my perspective on what, how the world operates. This is the 70s, early 70s, and everybody's marching, and everybody's complaining, and everybody's doing all this stuff. And the, the, the book was written by an economist, and he, was, and he was presenting how to live your life in a, in a world where you control your life, and, 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 and you don't have to worry about everybody else that has problems and does all this stuff. All you have to do is take care of who you are and, and, and what your circumstances are. So it was, it was, it was super in depth. I mean, I read it, I freaking took notes on it. I'm like, you know, and it changed my, the way I looked at, at life in general. I, it, it just, it, it just changed my perspective. And, and I felt like, yeah, I get it. I can see how you can live in a very restricted life, but have, but be free within your own the confines of your world, you know? A hundred percent, man. Yeah. Right. So, so that happens. This is probably, I have a, a little card that, that I have framed over here that Barney sent me, um, you know, wishing me happy new year. And that was in 73. So this is probably, the book was probably in, published in 72. Now the next how I found thing, freedom in an unfree world. Okay. How I found freedom in an unfree world. You can't really, it's hard to find the book, but you can find a PDF of it online for free. You know, great. Um, it's yeah, it's really, it was quite, quite, um, uh, compelling. So, so I'm, I'm a young guy and that hits me and I go, wow, man, dig that. Now, the next thing that happens is the thing that really altered the entire picture. Absolutely like dramatically. And I knew a girl in Los Angeles that I was dating before I met my wife. So we're so we're dating, and and uh, and we just started going out, you know. And so she she calls me and she says, "I can't go out tonight, or I can't go whenever tomorrow." Um, because I'm busy and I'm like, oh, that's a drag. And she says, but I'm actually going to this event. And if you want to come to it, um, I've got an extra ticket. And I'm like, well, sure, let's do that. You know, that's fine. I dig you. I don't care where we go. You know? yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, so she takes me to the LA sports arena and I proceed to listen to a fellow by the name of Werner Erhard. Oh yeah, of course. Speak. Yeah. Est. And I go, I don't know what this guy's talking about. And she had just done the S training. And I go, I don't know what this is, but it sounds fascinating. And then she and I kind of didn't see each other for a minute. And I wound up, um, I wound up signing up for this thing. And I went through this thing, <laughs> this S training. And dude, changed everything. It changed, it changed, it just, it was like all of a sudden, I was, you know, coupled with that book, all of a sudden I was, I was free of, I was free of like, I don't, I'm not worried about what people think of me. I am allowing life to be what it is. Be here now. That was their thing. Stay out of the way. I'm getting out of the way of my life. I'm going to say, this was their kind of the premise of it all. We as human beings are trying to control the narrative. We're trying to say, this is what we have to have. This is, you know, there was, there was a couple of things they would say, like, you don't get to have a, you don't get to, you don't get to say, you don't have a choice. You've already voted. You've already voted on your life. Right. You don't get a choice as to how it is. And 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 there was another saying that they had was what you resist persists. So so if you resist if you resist the things that that are are hindering you in your life, 
you're going to be run by those things. So here's the way it works. Accept everything as is. So something is a drag. Okay, that is a drag. We understand what a drag is. Great. That's a drag right now. Let's move on to the next thing. Yeah. You know, and all of a sudden what happened was the doors opened and I get the good gig. I get the Seals and Crofts gig. And then I become a studio musician. And then I'm, you know, I mean, I'm playing on these hit records and I, and then I meet my wife and I'm, it, it was like, it was, I look back on my life and I go, and I drive my kids because my kids like look at me and they roll their eyes because every now and again, I'll say something like, oh yeah, dad, yeah, the yeah, How, how you old know. are your kids now? 30, going to be 36 and 29. Okay. So they're, okay. They're past the point of, they, so they give you, they recognize the cool things about you too at this point. Yeah. Um, yeah. They seem to like me now. Which yeah. Is, um, yeah. Cause it's like 26, 27. That's when mine started. Like, you know, all of a sudden it's like, you're not a dick. It's like, Hey man, you might be onto something sometimes. Yeah. They do like me. Yeah. But, but yeah, that, that, that question, cause, cause I will talk to people and I don't, I'm not, a, you know, an S isn't even around anymore. It's, it's a different it's landmark. Land it's landmark. landmark. And I've actually thought about going just for fun and going to some of those th events they have. But, but man, it was, it was such a crazy, it was such a crazy thing, man. Like the, th what you did in this room, you know, like you would in the convention center and you, they would, they would talk and talk and talk and talk and talk. It's almost like brainwashing, you know, well, and then, that, and then they, they got in trouble have, for that. They got in yeah. trouble for that. Yeah. And then they would have you do these processes where you would, you would close your eyes and, and the thing is, like they would say, we're not trying to sell you anything. We're not trying to sell you a belief system. We are not trying to tell you anything about how to be. You are who you are. You need to be who you are. And you need to, and the reason that your life sucks is because you're not being who you are. Yeah. You're being, you're trying to be who you think they you want that people want you to be, or or you're resisting what what is true for you. And so if you if you just acknowledge the truth. And you allow the truth as bad as it can be. If you allow all of the things, if you create a space where you allow everything to simply be there, then they don't run you. You can have a very, very negative thing happening in your life. And if you can accept that, that, that it's there and move from there, that's, that's that experience. Okay. That's what that is. Thank you very much. Let's move on to the next thing. And that's the way I've run my life. And it's just been, when I said John Denner was cool, man, he was a big ass guy. And oh, literally we sat down when I met him on the first sessions, I said, dude, I said, I did the training, man. And I know you're, a, you know, and he goes, Oh my God. And we sat down, we talked for 45 minutes. Yeah. That's we cool. Sat down at a little play, a little table at Amigo while they were doing overdubs. And we sat and talked about life and how perspective and the whole thing. It was, you know, so yeah, so Barney was a huge influence in me musically and and personally, personally yeah. And Graydon was my total music mentor, and then Werner Erhard was the guy that really personally showed me how to be me, you know. So yeah, yeah I, great. I Good think question. It's, I think it's so important that whatever your thing is, you got some philosophy that you sort of apply. So to take yourself and I've said this on the show a couple of times, a buddy of mine says, I'm not part of the results committee anymore. And I really like that because it's Boy, that's like, a good, that's, a good that's one. fucking great. It takes yeah, all the pressure off. It's like, you know what? And that's how I feel. I'm, I'm going to do what I'm going to do. If it works great. If it doesn't it means maybe another adventure. I don't know, but okay. I'm not part of the results. Committee. That's so the way to look at it. Yeah. The if pressure. It if it doesn't work, there's a reason for that. I mean, right. maybe there's not a reason for that, but that is what it is. And guess what? That just opens up the door for the next so thing. That, right. What's next? You know? Right. Yeah. I'm not yeah. in the results. What is it? I'm not in the results. I'm not what? part of the results committee. <laughs> yeah. I like that. Right? I love that, man. Yeah. That's great. Very That's freeing. Great. Very liberating. Yeah. yeah. Do you have any hobbies outside of music? Ride a bike. I'm a bicyclist guy. I'm it's cycling. tough up there in uh, Boston. No, oh, my but, God. Well, you know, I can't do it now, but I'm cycling, you know, May through into November, you know, I did nine, I don't, I'm old. I, I only got 900 miles in last, last year, but I've been, I've been riding a bike like for years, man. What I used to of, tell people, I used to tell my friends, I said, when I'm out of the music business, I'm going to open up a bike shop, man. 
I've just always loved bicycles, man. Yeah, and that's pro that's like going from the most difficult profession to the second most difficult yeah. profession. Yeah. That's a tough retail. And, and, and actually, I kind of I got <laughs> I got really into it when I was doing sessions, and there was a guy by the name of Keith Albright that was a piano tuner in L.A. And I would see him at these sessions, and he'd show up he'd in his bike gear, <laughs> and he literally like rode from La Crescenta. He rode from studio to studio on a bicycle. And the That's guy wild. was, I'm in my 20s. The guy's probably in his 40s and he looks the bomb. And I'm yeah. talking to him and he goes, you know, man, I weighed 300 pounds at one time. I go, what? He goes, yeah. He says, I got into this exercise thing and I ride my bike. And he became my hero, man. I said, I'm getting a bike and I'm going to ride a bike and I'm going to be like Keith when I'm old. The last time I saw him, he was 70 and he had just like won some triathlon for 70 years old. And he was still right riding on. his freaking bike from studio to studio, tuning pianos. I Wow. Yeah, man, you got to yeah. exercise. That changes your life he was a <laughs> more hero. than anything. Yeah. Uh, one more question, Marty. And I, this has yeah. been great. I really appreciate your time. Yeah, man. no, Thank it's been a lot of fun. I hope you got some good stuff to edit. You know? <laughs> great stuff. No, see, this is this is not like you in the studio. This is uh, like a ghetto editing. <laughs> this is yeah. like, this is, a, this is a free for all. Tell me uh, yeah. biggest change in your personality over the last 10 years and how much of that has been intentional and how much has been a part of aging. Wow. Or we could talk Can about I string gauge. <laughs> <laughs> if you prefer. <coughs> Give me the question again. What's been the biggest change in your personality over the last 10 years? And how much of that is a, it has been intentional and deliberate and how much has just been a natural part of aging? Man, that's some kind of like philosophical or not philosophical, but that's like some kind of question you'd have to ponder, you know, man, I mean, you know, I, 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 I'm really having a hard time coming up with an answer to that one. Look, aging's aging. You know, you it's it's it, aging has not stalled me much yet. You know, I'm still pretty active. I've I've learned. You know, I was always one of these people who just like goes until things are done. Now I learned to like I go until the back says, "Okay, wait a second, you better take yeah. some time." Right. So I paced, I guess, I guess if I had to answer the question, it would probably be a lot more because of aging, but I pace myself more. So I pace myself. Okay. Wait a second. I'm getting it now. I pace myself a lot more in terms of having to do stuff. Like I can, I used to have to get everything done at once. Now I'm like, <laughs> okay, I can get it done to this point and then I can go from there. Um, um, the other big one is that, is that I used to worry about, I've always been, you know, in the mindset of worrying about dough, you know, like, am I going to have enough bread working? Do I get enough gigs? Do I do, you know, coming up as a, we've discussed at length about that, getting the gig at Berkeley has kind of changed that to where I'm not so concerned about. I'm not so concerned about, oh, man, I got to write, you know, when am I going to write some more music for my TV guy? Because he hasn't called in two months or something, you know, like I used to worry about that. Or or do I need to go and, and, and actively pursue some production projects, you know, because, you know, and, and so there has been an interesting thing over the last 10 years musically because there's a part of me that says I, I don't have to do the things that I, I don't have to do music that I don't want to do. I do music that I want to do now. I just released a couple of singles on my label, which everybody can have a label. You have 10 bucks and go to TuneCore, you got a label, you know. I just released a couple of songs that, that mean a lot to me. And I'm working on a piece of music right now that means a lot to me. That I'm just, I'm doing it, labor of love. I don't care about the bread. It doesn't matter. I just want to do <coughs> the music that I want to do, you know. And I do, I do still, I do still write music and I do, you know, produce music out of my studio, I would have to say that 
that the one thing that's definitely changed about that, which is noticeable, and I never noticed this before, but I just recently had to complete a bunch of music for my TV guy. I had to prep for the sessions that I did in LA, and I had to, there was another project that I was working on that needed my attention. And man, I'm doing this music for my TV guy, starting with, okay, there, this is the idea of the song we're gonna do. Okay, good, here's the drums. Here's the bass, here's the guitar rough, here's keyboard parts, here's guitar. It's all this mental thing, this mental like, okay, and I'm, I'm still good at it, I still know what I'm doing, I can get it done, but man, by the time six o'clock rolls around, I am beat. <laughs> what, you, whereas, what, what whereas, time do you start? Yeah, You're probably starting early though. Yeah, uh, 10 o'clock in the morning or something, okay. 10, 11. Yeah. But I mean, like, like if this was 20 years ago, I'm doing 12 hour days and I'm ready to keep going. Like sure, I'm just of course. Rolling, you know. Now it's like, whoo, the mental exhaustion, you know. I, yeah. I, I still know, I can still do the process. I, I understand the process. I can do it. And I just, I just did, I don't know what it was, five in the last month, I've done seven pieces of music for my guy um, that does TV. That's a lot. Yeah. And, you know, I've got, I do them in pretty much a day, you know. I do them and I pretty much get it all recorded in a day. The next day I come and I, I finish up a mix and I get it out to him and I start a new piece, you know. But it's, it's definitely, at my age, it's definitely like, man, the mental thing. It's, it's the first, I told my wife Libby, I said, I said, I'm freaking beat, you know. And I was like, the first time in my life I ever felt like doing music just wore me out, you know. Because it's the mental part of yeah, it. Yeah, I get it. You know? Fair enough, man. For whatever it's worth, like I said, you look great. You look like you take good care of yourself, man. Well, you know, man, when you get old, I mean, look, there, there's a lot of people that I know very recently have passed away. Oh, man. I mean, like, I'm that. telling you, man, like, scary, like, oh, my God, like, so-and-so's gone, and this person's gone, and this per I mean, like, literally, it has been nuts. It's been crazy, you know? And then I thought about it and I thought about every one of those people that I know that passed away. They're all, in, they're all my age or they're all around my age, maybe a little younger, maybe a little older. They were all way overweight, right? Uh, I mean, one. that's, there's Number no guarantees, one. but that yeah. is not helpful, man. And, and, and mm. the other thing is, they were all still boozing, <laughs> yeah. you know, because I haven't, I don't drink anymore. Yeah. You know, um, uh, there, there comes a point, you know, because I like drinking, man. Drink is cool. You're a musician, man. You're drinking. I love drinking beer, you know, drinking. It's great. It was part of the thing, you know, the drinking was part of the cultural thing. Sure. And, um, and, uh, and I kind of, you know, uh, various things kind of, I started to look at other people. I'm reading Lukather on Facebook. He goes, man, I'm all clean. He's not drinking. He's not. And I talked to him. I go, dude, like you just quit. He goes, yeah, he's not killing myself with alcohol. And I thought about it. And I thought, you know, man. And I'm talking to my wife. You know, my wife said, you yeah, know, this drinking thing. It's like it's, you, you're starting to look at people with about it. You know, you go, man, it kind of ages you. And, uh, you know, man, you can. It's, it's not, you know, it was time for. I, I haven't had a drink in three years, four, three sure. years, three years or something like that. And, and it was just kind of like time. And, but look, looking back on it now, I'm going, Hey, you said I look good. Yeah, man. I go to bed sober. Well, you, <laughs> you look know. fit. You look like you take, you look like you invest in yourself. Well, you I, look like. maybe, you know, yeah. you know, and, and look, Hey, I mean, we've been talking about this ad nauseum. You have to, you have to approach life with a, with a, with a, a level of happiness you uh -oh. can choose look you can look at your life and you can say things are if i wanted to choose right now to have a miserable life i could point to all kinds of things that i could say man my life sucks <laughs> if i wanted to or but or you can say hey my life is great because i accept and i've always accepted my life as is i take it as is so you say i look good i think it's because i've I, my stress level, my stress level because of what life is, has never been a problem. I've never stressed over that. That's great. I've stressed over money. 
I stressed yeah. over, can I pay the bills this month? That's been stressful. And I stressed over, how are my kids doing? That's a freaking stress you out. But Tell me, me personally, my, my personal life has always been pretty stress-free, man. I don't, I'm, don't, I don't complain about stuff. That, that ages you, man. You got to yeah. look, you got to come at life from a happy perspective. You know? Right on. Quick question for you. Yeah, the yeah. New singles that you just released, can people find them on MartyWalsh.com? Oh yeah, they're on my, it says Mart, yeah, MartyWalsh.com. There's a thing that says Mart, the Martonius, Martonius Tunes label or something like that. And they okay. would be there. They're there and you can find them on, uh, on, uh, on my Facebook page, I think, or my, All right. you know, on, on YouTube. Let me tell people a couple of places they can find you online. First of all, Marty has an album he put out in 2014, did real well. It's called The Total Plan. What was that? He wanted to talk about the title. Yeah, let me give you a little backdrop, if you don't mind. Are you you're, you're running low on time? Go ahead. Okay. Um, uh, when I started at Berkeley, I thought, hey, I should make a guitar record because I don't play guitar like the guitar players there. So I, I took a bunch of music that I had initially worked on at my studio that had vocals on it. I took the vocals off. And over a 10-year period, this started in 2004, over a 10-year period, I enlisted 28 people that I had worked with in the music industry in my career. And I would send them a file of a track. I would go, hey, John Robinson. I'd go, John, you and I wrote this track together, but it's got like your... Yamaha drums on it. Will you put a drum track on it for me? We own the thing. Sure. So <clears throat> he would sit, you know, it would take me three months to get it. And I'd get all the drum files and I'd put the, get the drums together. And then I had a bass. I, I went to my buddy, John Pena. And I said, John, I got the song I'm working with the JR. I need a bass track. I got no budget. I can't pay anybody, but if you wouldn't mind, you know, I can do barter or whatever. Yeah. But, you know, if you wouldn't mind, give me a bass track. I'd send him that. He'd take three months to get me the bass track. Well, anytime you're dealing with 28 people, man. It, yeah. So, so it was, it was just, years. it was like, I'm working on this song. Okay. I got John, I got Pena. I sent it out to my buddy, Michael Ruff, who by the way was that, I don't know if you know who Michael Ruff was. I do not. Is, and that was the best gig I ever had musically. But anyway, I sent it to him. So anyway, it took me 10 years and I compiled these tracks and, you know, I get my, I get the Valley Arch Strat out and I spent all this time doing guitar solos and stuff. And I did this guitar record and there's a, you know, and I featured everyone. I featured, you know, my buddy Bill Como is on it. My friend Nick Manson is on it, keyboard players, you know, I mean, and they're from all over. I'm, I'm sending tracks down to Nashville. I'm sending stuff to LA. I got guys in New York. I'm Michael Ruff's in Hawaii. I'm like, you know, sending stuff all over the world. And I just piecemeal getting these tracks back together. And by the time 2014 rolled around, I had finally finished the project. And I go, okay, what am I going to call it? And, and I remembered this story that I had heard about the band Toto. Now, we haven't talked about Jeff Picaro in this interview. Right. I worked, I worked with Jeff. I, I, the first time I played with Jeff, Jeff was an absolute, and I cannot say and any i i don't even know how to put it into words he was such a special musician he was his whole thing was so special and i was fortunate to have played with him when i was very young um the first time we played together i was 19 he was 17 it was before he became jeff picaro but it was known in the san fernando valley that there was this guy and he had come to the town and he was a drummer and there was something about him and it was true so anyway you know they're doing the toto thing and there was some, I heard this story, Brower, I think, told me about it. And apparently there was a band meeting. And, and one of the guys on the crew was being a problem. And the guys were saying, look, we think we've got to get rid of this guy, you know? And he'd been with them for some time. And Jeff, who was, the, he was the final word in pretty much everything, <laughs> when you'd work with him, he said, you, guys, we can't get rid of him. He's part of the total plan. <laughs> and I thought about, and I've always remembered that. So when I titled the record, I said, I got 28 people that were part of my total plan. Yeah. And that's right. the title. That's the title of the record. Very cool. The total plan. And the total plan. And it's a cool, and it's a record 
it's an album that I deliberately made. It's like pop tunes with instrumental stuff. It's not, it's not like let's get into, you know, the minutia jazz record. It's a, it's a, it's a record where normal people can listen to it and go, Oh, that's really good. Cause it's accessible. It's very melodic and it's very, you know, that was, the, that was the idea of it. Plus my kids are involved in it. My son Ian played piano on some of the tracks. We wrote one of the songs together. My son Eric designed the whole album cover, the three freaking panel thing. And very so, cool. Yeah, it's it was. That is a total love. plan. Labor of love, labor of love, really good. You you could check out the total plan on Marty's website. It's martywalsh.com. Also, uh, he's got a couple of YouTube channels. Uh, check them out and subscribe. Mad Dogs and Berkeley, and Berkeley is B E R K L E E and also the LA studio ensemble at Berkeley. Yeah. And um, do you want to have any social media you want to talk, promote? Uh, you know, man, I mean, I'm on Facebook. I'm on Instagram kind of a little bit. I'm not much of a, so I, I need to get better at it, but I kind of don't need to. So That's I'm, not part of you your know, total plan. It's kind of not, you know, <laughs> but I think about it and I go, I should be like Twitter, <laughs> Twitter man, and I should Instagram. And I kind of go, yeah, well, you know, maybe. Look, it's funny because I, I, I just, I just got a call by, from a, from a guitar player that's doing sessions in Boston. He's working out of his house and he's doing some pretty high end stuff. And he called me and he says, I need to study with you. And I'm like, why? And he goes, because, because I do all these tracks. I'm getting this music from people, you know, that are sending me stuff and I got to do these tracks. And I just don't know, you know, I don't know what, when to, I got, I just don't know how to do this. And he's really good. Right. I went and worked with him for three hours the other day. And, and we talked about his thing and I'm going to keep working with him to kind of hone him in. He just needs to be, He's very good and he's got a lot of equipment. He just needs to get dialed into, you know, making de decision making. Yeah. And, and so, and so I told him at the end, I said, dude, I said, man, you need to do this. You know why? Cause I don't want to do it, man. You're, you're the young guy, man. You're the young guy. You should be doing this. This is where you should be doing when you're 30 years old. I've already done it. I played with all these people, done all this stuff. I'm still playing music. I still dig it. But do I need to go promote myself on social media? No. I mean, you know, I love what I do right now. When's, and, the, book and, come, when's the book coming out? When is the Total Plan book coming out? That's well, what you don't know about the blog, apparently. No, I heard about it. Greco mentioned it to me. Oh, well, the, I have a blog and it's going to become a book soon, I hope. Awesome. There's, 40, there's, 30, there's 48 episodes to it. it they're all really short. Um, it's, uh, you can go to martywalsh.com and you can read it. It says my stu it says my, my studio career, I think is what it says. And, and, and the way it came about was I'm having lunch with Steve Lukather at the Ritz. And he said, I'm writing a book. And I said, yeah, man, I'm going to write a book too. It's going to be called the life and times of a second call studio musician. Cause Luke was the kid talk dog in the day. Yeah. He was like number one. You know, I'm gonna, and then we laugh. He goes, Oh yeah, no man. We were all the same. I go, dude, you're on another planet. And I got, and honestly, I got a lot of work that I did. I wasn't the first call. I was yeah. like, you know, Oh, I'm second call. I was second call, you know, but the first big record I played on was a song called love pains. And I wasn't, I was a demo musician and my brother wrote the song and the producer had called Jay Graydon to play guitar on it. And they called the three other guitar players and none of them were available on that day. So my brother said, hire my brother to play. I got a guy. He says, he says, <laughs> he played on the demo. They took my actual part. I played on my brother's demo for 50 bucks or whatever it was. And they, and oh, Michael and Marty and had transcribed it. And they were going to have a guitar player read it. And my brother said, just have my kid brother come play on it. And and I did that session. It was three hours. We cut three tracks. It's Jeff Picaro, Mike Picaro, me, Omar, Jay Graydon, in the Seals and Crofts studio with my brand new Roland JC120 amp that I'm using in stereo, which nobody was doing at the time. And all of a sudden, bang. Career. That's what it started, man. Yeah. You know? But um, anyway, I kind of lo lost trade of where I was going with that. My studio career is a second-rate musician. Oh, yeah. So the a second call. Yeah. Yeah. So anyway, so I told him that and I went, I went home and I wrote this little thing about I'm 15 years old. 
I'm going to be a guitar player. I do this. I study at Valley College. I, and I, have a, I, I scanned this card I got from Barney Kessel. And I go, you know, this is where it all started. And I posted it on Facebook. And after a couple of hours, I had like 250 likes. And I had all these people going, keep going. What's what part two? What's, yeah. What's, yeah. What's the next one? Now, they're very short, you know, because you can't write. You can't, people have no attention span. So I went, okay, I just kept it like you can. That's do a myth, things. man. That's a myth. Don't believe well, that. Okay. You can have, you can, I, I thought maybe I should keep them short. So I did the second one. Okay. You know, here I am. And I got pictures of Eddie Kendricks and, you know, doing that thing. And like, you know, and then I just, so I said, okay, well, every Monday at one o'clock, I'm going to publish. It took me a year. Every Monday at one o'clock, I published a new episode of my career. And, there you that's, go. and everybody says, dude, that's the book. I mean, I got the Sinatra story. I got the Michael Jackson story. I mean, you know, I got, I got a million stories, man. And I, I told them all and people are going, dude, you've got to put this in a book. The only problem is so much of it is video. It's like, yeah. And I did the Dolly Parton record. Bang. There's, you know, there's the follow-up single to nine and five that I played on. If you want to hear it, or there's the Eddie money stuff, or there's the, you know, Michelle Columbia album or, you know, there's all kinds of audio that you can access. I did videos. I put them on face uh, on on YouTube, so it can't be a printed book because you have to have. So I'm trying to figure out how to. You'll take figure it, it out, man. Yeah, you can you just make e a digital book. Ebook, yeah. Yeah, you just know. make a digital book. You'll figure well, it out. I may do an audio book. That's what people also they they say you should just do an audio book, man, and tell the whole story. Maybe. We'll look forward to it coming out, man. Yeah. Um, listen, thank you very much for everything. I really appreciate it. It has been nice yeah, I, talking to you, man. I, I, I thank I you for, your time. for asking me to do it, man. This is all, uh, you know, I mean, hey, I, I love doing this kind of stuff because I love promoting myself. <laughs> we just went through the Instagram thing and I go, yeah, yeah, you know, isn't it cool to be able to like, hey, somebody may see this and go, well, yeah, let's get, well, yeah, I need to, you know, send you some tracks. And I'll go, yeah, man, let's cut some tracks. Yeah. And how do they do that? Is, is there a contact tab on MartyWalsh.com? Yeah. Yeah. All you right. can just, yeah, you can just send me an email and, and, and away we go, you know, and I'm send still him, doing, send I'm, him a look, check. I'm, I'm, huh? send yeah, him a PayPal. check. Yeah. PayPal. <laughs> I mean, I, I'm still doing session work for people all over the place. I got a guy in London I've been doing tracks for, you know, I got people, I, I mean, you know, I, it's easy to do, you know, people just ship me files and I do guitar work and I, you know, I did a, I did an almost an entire record with a producer named, uh, with my buddy, Danny Deonte, who kind of resurfaced and, and, you know, he had this artist and, and he was just sending me files, man. It was last year, last year and beginning of last year, kind of, and, and prior. I did a they, whole ton of work for the guy. He just sends go. files over, you know, and then you send them back to send it to the mix engineer. And so I'm available. There you go. Send them the files. Go to yeah. martywalsh.com. And Do thank it. you, Martin. Do it. Okay, man. Thank you. Everybody, Frank. you're welcome, man. My pleasure. Thanks very much All for your right. time. Everybody, okay. thank you so much for listening. Excuse my cold. Uh, we appreciate it. If you, uh, if you enjoy what the show, share it on your social media channels. We appreciate your support. Check out Marty and what he's got going on and all his stories and his record, The Total Plan, and The Next Total Plan uh, okay. at martywalsh.com. And most important, remember that happiness is a choice. So choose wisely. Be nice. Exactly. Go play your guitar and have fun. Till next time, peace and love, everybody. I'm out. Okay, Marty, man. thank you we for everything. We will see you. Thanks, buddy.